Good afternoon. My name is Krista Regan and I am the Education Section Chief here at the North Carolina Museum of History. Thank you for joining us in partnership with Carolina K-12 Public Humanities for this special webinar on the Wilmington Race Massacre, Wilmington Coup of 1898. I am standing here in part of the story of North Carolina exhibit that focuses on the Reconstruction Era, the Wilmington Coup, and the Jim Crow Era. I cannot think of a more timely history lesson to help us understand the backdrop of racial, economic, and political strife. We welcome you to visit us as we prepare to reopen our doors to citizens across the state. I also encourage you to visit our website often as we add new materials for teacher and student consumption, such as our videos on demand, live streaming classes, and history magazines for students. So stay tuned. We look forward to building partnerships with you and I hope you look to the museum as we continue to find creative and innovative ways to share the history of our great state during these challenging times. Please connect with us and reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, for that great introduction. Um, we are so happy to have all of you here with us today. My name is Christy Norris. I am the director of Carolina K-12 at UNC Chapel Hill. My colleague, Paul Benici, is behind the scenes for technical assistance if you run into any problems throughout the webinar. And we are uh, really excited to be here with you this evening to delve into the history of Wilmington 1898, which as many of you know, is still in many ways, still very hidden history. We are also very appreciative of the Breitmeyer Foundation for providing funding for our Teaching Hard History initiative. So the goal of this series is to support teachers in exploring and teaching about our nation's shared hard history, um, basically to help ensure students understand the implications of our past and the very direct connections to our present and that they are empowered to address the challenges of the future. Brian Stevenson phrased it so perfectly when he said, our history has scarred us, it has bruised us, and it has injured us. But when we tell the truth about our history, we can change things. We can get to something that feels more like freedom and we can achieve something that looks more like justice. We can shift this narrative that has burdened us and resurrect the hope that animates many of us. So that is our goal for this evening and with this initiative, to face the hard stuff, but to find the hope when doing so, to teach about the resistance and the agency and the survival of incredible people through every period of history, despite extreme and incredible adversity. And so to all of you incredible teachers joining us this evening, we fully understand that this can be hard, hard work. It can also feel really risky to many of you for a whole multitude of reasons, some of which we'll get into later, and not to mention the fact that you are all teaching at least part, if not all, of your days um, online. And we are all starting to feel the effects of pandemic fatigue for sure but we want you to know that we appreciate you, that we support you, that we praise you, that we lift you up, and we believe in you for doing this really, really critical and important work. So even though it doesn't always feel like it, you have the power to shine the light of truth into the darkest corners of our past. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this so far as the truth is ascertainable? So our hope for tonight is that you will be intrigued enough to want to learn more, uh, that you will leave us and go and read and study, um, because the fact is that even though two and a half hours is a long time on Zoom, two and a half hours is not nearly enough time to cover all of the history of Wilmington 1898. And so know that this is just a beginning. And after tonight and the next couple of days, you're going to get a list of resources from articles to step-by-step -step lesson plans that you can use to implement this into your classroom. 
So in terms of our program for tonight, uh, the first half of our event will be focused on historical content. And at around 6.30 p.m., we have a really special uh, performance by two Black artists uh, who are going to do a couple of songs for you guys and offer you a little bit of a brain break. And then we're going to switch over to a new panel and spend the last hour talking about pedagogy and how do you actually do this in the classroom? What does that actually look like? So stay with us. We know you've had a really long day teaching, but we hope you find tonight really relevant, especially since it's basically been built around the questions that you guys asked when you registered. So we hope you'll leave learning what you came here seeking. Uh, you can also still continue to ask questions via the Q&A box there at the bottom. Um, quick logistical aside, because we have such an a large audience, like over 300 of you, uh, you are all going to stay muted with cameras off for the evening, um, but you can write into the Q&A box. Only the panelists will see it rather than all of the participants, unless a panelist answers you in writing and then the question will show up publicly. But if you don't see your question pop up, know that we can see it. And so do utilize that feature throughout the program. And so with that, let's begin a look back at 1898 Wilmington, 122 years ago when white politicians, business leaders, and just working men, everyday folk, planned and strategically revolted against interracial democracy and our nation's only successful coup d'etat. But also, as written by one of our panelists this evening, David Soselski, in the preface to the incredible book, Democracy Betrayed, we look to Wilmington in 1898 as to all this nation's racial history, not to wring our hands in a fruitless nostalgia of pain, but to redeem a democratic promise rooted in the living ingredients of American life. And so with that, I would like to first welcome Lou Ray Umfleet, who is going to provide a whirlwind 15 to 20 minute overview of 1898 Wilmington. And after that, I'll be inviting David Soselski and Dr. Freddie Parker on for a discussion, again, based on the questions that you are asking. So Lee Ray Umfleet, uh, she is a part-time rock star. She works with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources to develop outreach and specialty programming projects on behalf of the Secretary's Office. She has a super long career in public history throughout which she's worked with organizations such as the Office of Archives and History, the North Carolina Collection, the Jewel Lane Museum House in Raleigh, Davis Library and Historic Hope Plantation. She has served on numerous boards, including the Board of Directors for the North Carolina Museums Council, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, the North Carolina Preservation Consortium, the Historic Stagville Foundation, and so many more. Uh, she published A Day of Blood, the 1898 Wilmington Race Riot, um, this is a book that you all want to get as soon as you can. It's got incredible primary sources in it. It's um, really just a one-stop shop of information. And it's based on the research for which she was awarded the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit and their prestigious WOW Award. So, Lee Ray Umfleet, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, and I will turn it over to you. Well, hello everyone. How are you? I am new to this Zoom thing, so I'm going to show you my screen and give you, as Chrissy said, a very, very, very brief overview of what 1898 was and is, and um, then we can move from there. You'll notice on my title screen I have an asterisk after riot because the events of November 10th, 1898 were many things. They weren't one word can encapsulate what was happening, but it was a riot because at the time a riot was white invasion of a black neighborhood. It was massacre because many men were murdered in the streets. It was a coup because this government was overthrown. So I use many, many words to describe what happened on November 10th, 1898. So briefly, if I can get my screen to cooperate. We will begin to try to understand 1898. And for me, everything goes back to politics of 1898. And at that time, we have Democrats and Republicans on opposite ends of the spectrum. And we have to remember that in 1898, Democrats and Republicans were not Democrats and Republicans of the 21st century. The Democrats were the party of conservatives. They were former Confederates. 
and they were the party of white supremacy. The Republican Party was the opposite end of the spectrum where most African Americans were members of the Republican Party and it was a progressive party. However, in the middle we had a third party called the Populist Party and these were mostly disaffected Democratic voters who felt like the Democratic Party wasn't addressing their needs. So in 1896 and 1898 and 1894 even, we have this thing happening in state government where populist voters and Republican voters used and merged their voting power to defeat the Democrats at the voting box. And that led to Governor Russell being elected the first Republican governor since Reconstruction and control of the legislature moving into a more egalitarian place where they were passing laws that benefited the entire population, just not one segment of the population. However, in 1898, Farnacold Simmons, the leader of the Democratic Party, decided that he wanted to regain power for the Democratic Party. It was a multi-step process, and it began with taking over the legislature with the fall elections of 1898. And his grand plan was 1898, gain control of the legislature, 1900, gain control of the governor's office. And so we are at the beginning stages of his grand plan. And so the violence in Wilmington is an outflow of a political campaign. Simmons had a multi-strategy victory uh, campaign, and it was in the days before Twitter and before CNN and Fox News. So he had men who could write, those are the newspaper people, men who could speak, those are the stump speakers who would travel around and give pro-democratic party white supremacy speeches across the state, and men who could write. And this was the militant of the Democratic Party, and these were red shirts, and they were part of a white government union as well. And these were quasi-sponsored by the Democratic Party, and they were the violent piece of the puzzle that would physically intimidate voters and keep them away from the polls. Really quickly, men who could write are people like Josephus Daniels from the News and Observer in Raleigh. He would run articles in his paper, and if he knew that they were not true, he would not retract them because he would say that it supported his cause. And he also had uh, cartoons, such as the one you see here. And if you were not completely literate, you may can still look at this cartoon and realize that uh, Negro rule was a danger for women and children and that white men need to do all that they can in the ballot box to protect white womanhood. And these things were found throughout the fall of 1898. Men who could speak are men like Alfred Moore Waddell. He was a Wilmingtonian. He was a very good, fiery speaker. And he put Wilmington on the forefront of the program for the Democratic Party as the city that was the largest town in North Carolina. And as an excerpt of his speech that he gave in Wilmington on November 7th, and you can't get any more clear about how the Democratic Party felt that they needed to go about winning the election than to just look at these few sentences from his speech. We should win tomorrow if we have to do it with guns. Men who can ride were the red shirts. And these are uh, some red shirts in Laurenburg. This is election day, 1898. And you can see that there are plenty of guns and lots of opportunities for intimidating voters at and from the polls. And it was uh, the case in Wilmington as well. The red shirt phenomenon started in 1898 in North Carolina, came from South Carolina. And it was evident in 1898 campaign and the 1900 campaign. And I'll let uh, my good friend David talk to you more about the red shirts. Just know that they were a militant arm of the Democratic Party. Why Wilmington? Wilmington was the largest city in North Carolina, 50-50 African-American white population. It had a coalition government of African-Americans and whites running the city. It was the place that you could make it regardless of your status prior to the Civil War, free, enslaved, poor, white. Everyone can make it in Wilmington. And uh, wages were higher, education levels were higher. Um, Entrepreneurs could start a new business and prosper. There were African-American businesses in the main business district downtown. They had white and black customers. So Wilmington was what the New South could envision being at the turn of the 20th century. However, all the events of 1898 put a stop to that. Also in the mix, we have Alex Manley. 
Uh, he's an African-American publisher of a paper in Wilmington called the Wilmington Record. Many people think that he is white, but he was actually a mulatto and an offspring of a possible rape on the plantation of Governor Manley of an enslaved woman on the plantation. And Manley was pro-Republican Party, used his paper as a tool to communicate across the community of Wilmington for the African-American community and the Republican Party. As such, he became a target of the Democratic Party campaign and an example of how black men were forcing their views on white men and needed to be suppressed. And that is a very short story of Manley and his life, but Christy only gave me 20 minutes, so I have to keep it short. So election day, 1898, um, the Democratic Party won seats in every um, category that they had a candidate up for. And there was even fraud at the ballot box in Wilmington with some precincts having uh, red shirts override the voter count and stuff the ballot boxes for Democratic Party candidates. November 9th, the day after the election, the white city leaders had won every category that they could win in, except for that the election was not for the leadership of the city and county. That would have to happen later. So the city council would be up for election or re-election in March 1899. So the leadership came together on November 9th and passed what we call the White Declaration of Independence, where they said, we will no longer be ruled by men of African origin. And then they set out a series of demands. Alex Manley needs to stop printing his paper. Alex Manley needs to leave the city. The mayor and the board of aldermen need to resign. A committee of 25 people were appointed to uh, carry out these rules and directions. And Alfred Moore Waddell, the great speechmaker, was made chair of that committee. Waddell and others from Wilmington pulled in a leading group of African American citizens and made their demands known to them. The group of colored citizens, as they were called, were supposed to provide to Alfred Moore Waddell the next day on November 10th how they were going to make all those things happen. They were unable to get that to Waddell, and on November 10th, a crowd of angry white men assembled at the Wilmington Light Infantry Armory here on Market Street and demanded to fumigate the city with the ashes of Manley's printing press. So Waddell organized his men in skirmish lines because he was, after all, a Confederate colonel and marched them to the printing press building where they presumed, where they continued to burn the building. They ransacked the building before it was burned and then they stopped to take a photograph. So Manley was warned ahead of time that this was going to happen or that his life was in danger. So he fled the city and uh, once the building was destroyed, Waddell told the folks who were in attendance that they had done their duty, that white womanhood was protected, and that they needed to go back home and rest on their laurels. However, we now know that once you get adrenaline pumping into um, folks like this and crowd mentality steps in, it's sort of hard to turn off that switch and bring your morality back into play. And so once people who had been at the shooting or the firing of the building they then go back to their own neighborhoods and then all hell broke loose uh, late, after, late morning of the 10th. And um, this is the corner of 4th and Harnett, a uh, couple days after violence. And the um, witness accounts said that there was a group of African American men on that corner and a group of white men had just gotten off the trolley. You can see the trolley tracks in the bottom left. And they started hurling accusations across the intersection at each other and shots rang out and two black men died where you see the X marks on the screen. And from there, it turned into a running firefight. Um, account very as to the number of people who were murdered. Um, at least 40 to 60 folks were killed that day. It probably was higher, but we just don't have the documentation to give us their names and where they died, unfortunately. We have this thing called the Flying Machine Gun Squadron. The businessmen of the city purchased the machine gun for the use of the Wilmington Light Infantry to protect white businesses in the city. The Wilmington Light Infantry had a machine gun squadron chaired by William Rand Keenan. Yes, I'm a Carolina girl, but I understand. And so 
Keenan and his crew wheeled the wagon around town. Uh, we have uh, an account of uh, as many as 25 people dying at an intersection where the machine gun was placed at Bladen and Bladen. So the machine gun was just another part of an intimidation tool to murder weapon of 1898. And also we have a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat is a legally elected government being overthrown by a military um, action. So the time the bullets were flying around Wilmington and the mayor and board of aldermen were summoned to city hall by Waddell and the committee of 25. They one by one resigned and the way the city charter was written as someone resigned from the city council, another person was high, uh, voted in by the existing members to fill the vacancy until the election. So within a short period of time, management of the city moved from a fully legally elected government to one that was um, appointed under duress with about 200 armed men in city hall. And that uh, change was validated in March of 1899 with an election that brought the democratic power back into place. Waddell was made mayor of the city. That is the only successful coup d'etat in United States history that we can identify. Um, afterwards, there was a banishment campaign that started on November 10th, where a handful of black leadership was arrested, put in the jail overnight, and escorted out of town on the 11th, and told never to return. The um, leaders meant that. One person was met when he came back to town with a lynch mob, and he barely escaped with his life. There was a banishment campaign that was very successful in addition to the exodus campaign that happened beginning during the violence people fled their homes and their um, workplaces with clothes on their back fled to the city's uh, perimeter and um, never came back the dead were buried under cover of darkness we only have one cemetery marker in wilmington that gives the death date of november 10th and then there were changes in workforce and economic status with African-Americans being fired at every point and whites being hired. Up it all off with a suffrage amendment that passed in 1900 that virtually eliminates the black vote from uh, government for the next few decades. And you have had a complete change from a, a government, a, a state, county, local government that gave African Americans the ability to prosper and grow to one that put them into second class status and fully implemented what the Plessy versus Ferguson 1896 decision was, which was separate but equal. And it was separate, but it was not equal. So that is a very, very, very brief overview of 1898. I'll be more than happy to answer the questions as we move forward. I also know that Christy has some really good resources for you, and um, we can hear from there. Thank you, Ray. You questioned whether you could do Wilmington 1898 in 20 minutes, and you just did it. So. I'm going to let you go and take a drink of water and have a breath and then we're going to bring you back because we do have lots of questions coming in for you. Um, so we'll bring you back in just a little bit to talk about those. So while you take a little rest, I'm going to ask uh, David Soselski to come on and join us to kind of layer into this conversation. David has written several award-winning books and hundreds of articles about history, culture, and politics in North Carolina. He and Dr. Tim Tyson co-edited um, this incredibly insightful book, another one that I highly suggest you get, Democracy Betrayed. Um, he also wrote a sensational chapter in that book about probably one of my favorite historical figures ever, who he talked to us a little bit about in our last episode, um, Abraham Galloway, the 19th century Black James Bond, as I have heard him called. Uh, he was also recently the recipient, along with Dr. Tim Tyson, of the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association's Kreitzenen Award for Lifetime Achievement. And his blog, davidsoselski.com, which we will share in the follow-up resources that we're going to send to you, is just an excellent place to read about all kinds of buried history um, that David is really just wonderfully unearthing for all of us. So, David, welcome. Thank you for being here. Are there, you Christy. doing okay? Are you hitting the pandemic wall like so many of us, or are you still pushing through? Life is great. Life is great. That's, That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, that's me. That's what I say too. Actually, David's heard me say I have a seven-year-old, you know, doing remote learning and it's like giving a cat a bath. So again, teachers, we love you. Um, so David, I want to start by talking a bit about this great article you wrote, Summer of the Red Shirts. And again, this is going to be in the list of articles and resources that we send to all of you um, tomorrow or Friday. And in that article, you say that if you were going to pick a single moment in your state, North Carolina's history that shaped our current racial dilemma and political divisions, you would go back 120 years to the summer of 1900. So you were actually taking us into the years directly following 1898, um, when certainly the coup and related events are still very fresh. So could you take, you know, eight to 10 minutes here and just tell us a little bit about what was happening in Wilmington at this time, not just Wilmington for that matter, statewide, because this actually, we shouldn't just pick on Wilmington. This was unfortunately a statewide situation. Um, but take us back to that time and tell us why you think that that is really the pivotal moment. Sure. Um, Lorraine was awesome. Um, I'm not sure I can talk as fast as Lorraine. <laughs> um, she, it was amazing. Um, it's lovely to be here with uh, the teachers, especially um, uh, if, if there's anything I can ever do for any of you uh, to help you with the work that you're doing in the schools, please let me know. Um, and to the best of my ability, I'll, I'll be there for you. And you can find ways to reach me um, on, on my website or through, or through Christy. That article that Christy just mentioned uh, came about because young people involved in the Black Lives Matter movement were barraging me with questions and Zoom calls and what all after George Floyd's murder. And they, they pushed me to think about the things that I, I knew about the state's past, but in new ways. Um, they basically wanted to know how we got into this fix. How did we become a, a, such a divided society? How did we get to the point where um, uh, uh, black and white uh, pe people are divided in the way that we are in North, Car North Carolina? Um, uh, how did prisons bec become part of, of, of the way that African-American people are oppressed. They didn't care about some of the, many of the things that Tim Tyson and, and I had focused on in that book, Democracy Betrayed. When we were young, that was 20 years ago, youngish, <laughs> um, uh, very few people knew, knew about Wilmington, what had happened. We rarely met people that did. And, uh, in a way, we were trying to bring out the story, and then other people, other people did as well, including maybe most importantly, Larray, um, and many good teachers. Uh, and at that point, we ourselves were sort of shocked because I, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina, and um, you know the people that we were taught in school to esteem and hold most dear, Charles Acock and all these other famous people that our, our dormitories were named after, our high schools, statues everywhere. We were learning that they were part, that they were um, behind the violence in Wilmington and much more. So if I had to go back to one place where that ripping up a part of us the people of North Carolina occurred. It's to the period, yes, 1898, but in a way more 1900. In 1898, what happens in Wilmington is an atrocious act of racial violence and a violent splitting of black and white in that one city. By focusing so much on Wilmington, however, I think we sometimes forget that small Wilmingtons were happening all over North Carolina in 1898. Elizabeth City, Statesville, Asheville, you name it, it was happening. 
So it's no like, let, let's look down, you know, there's no looking down at, at Wilmington about, you know, those people down there. This was happening. And then in 1900, building around a campaign of, uh, uh, to pass a amendment to take away the right of black peoples, the right of African-American voting. They began to, the people who were behind the violence in 1898 really set about to institutionalize what they've done. And what I mean is that, and I have, sorry, I have to look at my notes here, their goal was to create a world in which overt violence and overt corruption and overt electoral fraud were no longer necessary to ensure what they called white supremacy. So they had done all of those things. They admitted that they did all of those things. In many cases, they bragged that they did all of those things. But their idea was to build a new society, a new political culture in North Carolina that preserved white supremacy, that separated black and white people from one another, that eliminated the opportunity that we would reach across the aisle and, and strike a harmonious relationship, build political alliances with our white and African-American neighbors. So they basically create much of the world that we live in today in 1900. As I said, the thrust of the campaign was a state constitutional amendment to take away black voting rights. The amendment had three components, uh, a poll tax, a literacy tax, I'm sorry, a literacy test and a grandfather clause. In a way, none of that really mattered because like, for example, with the literacy test, everywhere they went during this campaign in the summer of 1900, they made sure to say, it doesn't matter how illiterate a white person trying to register to vote is, they're gonna say he can read or she can read eventually. And the same with Buck, and they, they said it again and again. They say, oh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a black man with a PhD, he's gonna be illiterate. So there were these three parts, but they mattered. They helped provide some judicial coverage later in the century. But at that time, it, it came down to power and violence. The campaign included widespread electoral fraud, included violence, and I'm talking about across the state. Uh, some historians believe there was more violence in the 1900 campaign than there was in the 1898 campaign, including the massacre in Wilmington. Uh, uh, the one African-American scholar who has really studied both, published about both areas, concluded that himself. Uh, and of course, then it, it, it included a great deal of rallying around white supremacy. The red shirts, as Larry said, were a violent kind of Ku Klux Klan type group. Uh, there, were, there were almost a thousand what they called white supremacy clubs, massive rallies of thousands, and prominent speakers, including uh, six uh, former or, or future governors of North Carolina. Uh, many, if you, any of you went to any of the state's public and many, or private universities for that matter, you would probably recognize their names. Um, I know I don't have much time, but I read, want to just read you a couple of quotes from sympathetic newspapers that were sympathetic to the white, to the disfranchisement amendment about the, the way they, these rallies occurred. This is a quote. Uh, Charles Acock was the star orator at the meeting today. His trip from Hamlet to Lumberton was a series of ovations. With him were three or 400 men wearing red shirts, red ties and badges, announcing that they favored white supremacy. Similarly, this is another quote. 
When Lumberton was reached, about 1,000 men wearing the red shirts and on horseback were lined up to receive the orator. Back of them were thousands of people backed up on the main street of the pretty little town. Women were almost as numerous as the men and just as enthusiastic. Hold on just one second. This was from a rally of 3,000 people in Gatesville, which is a town of about you know, a few hundred people up by the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, General Roberts, who was a, at the time, the last living Confederate general, but he's from Gatesville, and his painting still hangs at the courthouse. General Roberts says the red-shirted men and red-ribbon women who appear at the big meetings come in that color because it is emblematical of the blood which will be spilled if necessary. One or two more. One of the biggest red shirt demonstrations was at Keenansville in Warsaw, Duplin County today. An escort of 1,000 men wearing red shirts and many of them carrying Winchester rifles and breech loading guns escorted Honorable C.B. Acock from Warsaw to Keenansville where he spoke to 6,000 people or more. And two other quick short ones. I know Christy's looking at her clock. Um, but these are important. This is from a former congressman. If a white man takes the side of Negro equality in Halifax County, the worms must eat his body. Separating black and white was important. They, were, they, they, they targeted sympathetic whites as much. For example, in this quote, also referring to the former congressman, if you are a heathen or savage, go and vote against the amendment and eat and drink and sleep with the Negro. But I am sorry for the Negro. A white Negro is 10,000 times worse than a black one. The white supremacy movement was extraordinarily successful. Hold on just one second here. On the 2nd of August, 1900, the disfranchisement amendment passed by a landslide. The scale of the violence and electoral fraud in that election has never fully been calculated. For example, in New Hanover County, which was a majority, as LeRae said, was a majority black African-American county, there were only two votes registered against the uh, disfranchisement amendment, the amendment aimed to, at taking away the rights of black people. The election's other results were also far reaching. Governor Acock was elected governor, uh, Charles Acock was elected governor. He would go on to become the most lauded the most honored political figure in all of North Carolina history. As many of you know, his statue is still on the grounds at the uh, governor's mansion and it's still on the grounds of the US Congress, was well, still in the US Congress. Um, I'm gonna read just a little bit from the article and then we'll be done. Overall, the white supremacists gained total control over the state's political system, the governorship, the legislature and the courts. They held that power for more than 60 years. I'm not aware of a single white political leader in the state of North Carolina who spoke out publicly against white supremacy in the first half of the 20th century. Similarly, for more than 50 years, neither major political party ran a statewide candidate that publicly opposed whites only governor, government. The disfranchisement amendment wasn't completely undone until 1965 when the civil rights movement succeeded in pushing the US Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And here's where it gets, here's where it really sticks us. 
The consequences of that long period of white rule reached into every corner of our society. While they were in power, the white supremacists of 1900 and their heirs stitched white supremacy deeply into the fabric of North Carolina's institutions. Voting districts, precinct lines, polling sites, and hours, the locations of roads and other infrastructures, public school spending, policing methods, judicial and sentencing standards, the penal system, workplace rights, lending and banking practices, health care and social services funding, historic sites and museums, and even the locations of sidewalks, parks, and shaded streets. White supremacy shaped them all. For generations, the state's white leaders acted as if no part of state, county, or municipal government was too large or too small to be shaped first and foremost by race. This is not exactly a happy story, and I know we'll be talking about it in um, the pedagogy part, but I have to say, I think the younger generation deals with hearing this information totally different than mine did. Mine was kind of mostly denial and astonishment, and why, were, why weren't we told this, and everything else, you know, I mean, the younger people that I've been speaking with, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement, they're like, oh, well, this explains a lot. Okay, now let's go out and deal with it. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> so, interesting, as you were talking, somebody said in the chat box, you know, this feels, sounds eerily similar to things happening today. So I think um, there are some very concerning three lines for sure. I think young people, I think all of us like to understand the world in which we live. Our educations, if you grew up in North Carolina like I did, uh, generally speaking, have not prepared us to understand that world. You know, there's that passage in Corinthians that we see, you know, through, through it as if through a glass darkly. Mm. And in a way, that's where we are. And I, and I think it's a um, liberating, I think it's a liberating thing to understand the world that you're in and then we have the chance to begin to confront it and to change that world right you have to face it to fix it thank right. you very much yeah thank you it's interesting um you know just listening to you and based on the comment that was made in the chat box it reminded of the, me of the um part from the ghosts of 1898 that your friend and colleague dr tim tyson worked on with the news and observer and, and that he said Cynical, ruthless politicians rose to authority by fanning white fear and loathing of blacks, that this was strategic, a strategic sowing of division and paranoia. Which they is could exactly have done it in a different way, Christy, they would have. They sat down and said, what is the best way to divide? Mm. They really believed that they would never be elected again if black and white people continued to be a political coalition as they were from 1894 to 1898. Mm. So they say, how, how, where are the weak points? Where, where, what, where's the soft underbelly? Right. If, it, if, if it had been uh, a love of mustard, I don't know what it would, you know, that they, they would have gone for it. Right. And then of course they set about to create a political society in which that can't happen again, that those, in a way that those divisions become so accepted in society that you don't think about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the world that I grew up in, right. in Eastern North Carolina. It, 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 I wasn't taught any of, any of this. And I, it, I think a lot of people, I, I sympathize because it's not that people, in my experience, it's not that people, we weren't prepared, we weren't educated to understand when something like Black Lives Matter goes off and the killings of George Floyd and things of that sort. 
most of us, including me, were not educated in a way to help us to understand fully what that uh, those events because we don't know this history right and and the next generation with the help of all of these wonderful teachers mm -hmm. is not going to make that mistake right. um right so and not only that you know this strategic rewriting of history the fact that the organizers the main players in this white supremacist campaign are then heralded in our textbooks as you know, the, the gentry, the royalty of North Carolina. I taught North Carolina history. Um, it's probably, it's about 12, 15 years ago. And my North Carolina history textbook talked about Charles Acock as the education governor. And it talked about so much that he had done for education in the state. And as you just described, he was a main player, you know, working at UNC Chapel Hill. We know many of our buildings are named after these folks. And so to not only be successful, but then to strategically rewrite the narrative is really incredible. And I think it's true of any, after every revolution, the people that come into power, this is what you do, right? You re, in Russia or any, you know, Soviet Union, you, you uh, and they were very purposeful so that the people who, the people who did this created most of the state's historic sites, most of the state's historical markers much good work by museum people and people in the Department of Cultural Resources has begun to change this. Right. But if you go to the Charles Acock historic site, his birthplace outside Goldsboro, you will not learn any of this. Mm. They won't tell you about it. And except for one little thing in the back corner somewhere, you're not gonna hear about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Governor's Mansion, you'll still see Charles Acock. Right. There's been a phenomenal amount of change, uh, you know, much of it due to Black Lives Matter and 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 it that creating that public pressure to support teachers and the rest of us that that have been trying to change all of this. Mm -hmm. But um, the history department, these these this crowd created the history departments where we learned our history that created the uh, archives and and you know so much good work has happened to change that and the resources are now there you know at the museum of history and at many other places mm -hmm. in the state to um uh, uh to learn this history and to confront that past in a um you know, not in a doctrinaire way, but in a, in a, a usable, in a usable fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, that's an incredible improvement over the last 20 years. And in the last year or so, even, you know, it, it really since George Floyd's murder. Right. Um, and, um, so, uh, forward right i mean i mean it's 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 um uh as as that quote that you used earlier said that all of history and i i write about all kinds of history from you know eastern north carolina i love talking about the beautiful things in eastern north carolina i've written about everything from quilting to boat building to um you know goodness knows you know i've i wrote about hundreds of stories on on food <laughs> yeah. I like to eat right about. <laughs> uh, and you know in, in Eastern North Carolina um, but there's no way that you're going to look honestly at, at the past and particularly not in, in this case um, without going into some dark places right and 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 young people are hungry for it right right they, they're trying to they're 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 trying to figure out how did how did we get here yeah and um even if their parents aren't <laughs> well right and a lot and and a lot of their parents are to be you know as well i mean some parents some know but um uh it, it it's they may i do believe i have a lot of faith and you know i spend half my time in a 
one kind of culture in Durham, but I spent half my time at the little farm where I grew up in a rural conservative part of North Carolina. And um, uh, I think people are hungry to know. It's fun. Uh, uh, I want to, there, there's so much here and there's some great questions coming through, but I want to bring Dr. Freddie Parker on screen with both of us um, to weigh in on some of this and to keep this conversation going. Um, let me just say a little bit about the incredible Dr. Parker. He's Professor Emeritus at North Carolina uh, Central University. And he's the author of the books Running for Freedom, Slave Runaways in North Carolina and Stealing a Little Freedom, Advertisements for Slave Runaways in North Carolina. In 2008, Dr. Parker was appointed by Governor Easley to the African American Heritage Commission, also appointed by Governor, Governor Beverly Perdue as the chair of the commission. He was appointed by Governor Easley to the North Carolina Historical Commission in 2001, reappointed in 2007, is the past chairman of the North Carolina Historical Highway Marker Commission and a member of the Historical Society of North Carolina as well as the North Carolina Society, wonderful society that's supporting a lot of our workshops for teachers. Um, you may recognize him because he's a little bit famous. He has been in various PBS and BBC television specials such as Why Celebrate Juneteenth, Blacks in Civil War North Carolina, The Residual Effects of Slavery, Slavery in the Making of America, many more. Um, like I said, he's just, a, he's just a famous dude. And so Dr. Parker, we're happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much for being here. It is always good to be with you, Christy. I've uh, been doing this with you for, what, 12, 15 years now? And it, how many years? Five, minute. 10? <laughs> always enjoy uh, speaking to teachers across the state of North Carolina. You and David both are big teacher proponents, and I think you right. both are Lee Ray as well. So I know you've been listening both to what Lee Ray said, what David has just shared. There's there's so much here, but um, before we dive in, I'd actually love to hear from you. Anything else that you think we haven't there's so much we haven't said yet, but anything else you think we really need to hone in on in terms of its importance? And also in terms of the lasting legacy. So David kind of took us up through the 1900s, but um, you know, I've heard several historians say the playbook of 1898 is very fresh and in use today. Um, one of the teachers has asked Matt, um, in what ways can we see Fernifold Simmons, men who can speak, men who can write, men who can ride being played out in 2020 America? So what do you think? What are the connections between then and now? What else do we really need to pay attention to? Thank you, Christy. Let me say uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Lorraine. You always uh, do an outstanding job and always good to be uh, on panels with you. And uh, I want to say uh, how to do to all the great teachers out there. Keep on doing what you're doing. Stay safe and, and surely we, you, uh, you have our support. Um, I have uh, written a little script here because, you know, I love to talk, and so I know I only have a few minutes, so I've, I've put some things here so I won't be all over the place. Uh, I want to start, actually, by, by placing uh, the Wilmington Massacre of 1898 in an historical context by looking at John Hope Franklin's book, The Militant South a book that was written way back in 1956 and still has tremendous value for us in 2020. Dr. Franklin wanted to explain the violent character of Southerners, why they responded and institutionalized violence like people in no other part of the country, how violence became part of the South's social and cultural heritage. Most importantly, keeping the tradition alive and making it a part of the apparatus for maintaining white supremacy. Violence in essence became a central theme of Southern history and people white and black who challenged this racial orthodoxy learn by a bitter experience what the costs could be. So through slavery and, and thereafter, 
with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan beginning in 1866, the Knights of White Camellia in 1867, and other organized and unorganized groups who were bent on trying to maintain a system that was akin to slavery. A year after the ending of slavery, nearly 50 blacks were killed in Memphis, Tennessee, in riots that broke out in May. Undoubtedly, they were frustrated by Confederate defeat in the Civil War, and they seized the opportunity to use what they were accustomed to. And what they were accustomed to was violence to solve their issue. Especially they could not deal with black union soldiers telling them what to do. Move on, you gotta get out of here. Could not deal with that. Thousands of blacks and whites were killed during the reconstruction period and thereafter. We know that approximately 3,000 documented lynchings occurred by 1910, most of them taking place in the South, including in 1870, the lynching of Wyatt Outlaw in Graham, North Carolina. I'm sitting just three miles from Graham, North Carolina, as a matter of fact. A few months later, the killing of, of uh, another uh, individual involved in the struggle was John W. Stevens over in Caswell County. In 1873 would be the massacre of 150 blacks in Colfax, Louisiana over political divisions. 1898, that same violence, that institutionalized violence played out in Wilmington, North Carolina. The Atlanta massacre of 1906, Springfield, Illinois in 1908, Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, Tulsa, 1921, Rosewood in 1923. The sad reality is that so much of the violence in the South was and continues to be state sponsored. It continues to be state sponsored. What I mean is that since slavery ended, police sanctioned beatings, direct participation by law enforcement, and the destruction of the black body to maintain white supremacy has been and is still evident. The Afro-American League founded in 1890, the Afro-American Council, the Niagara Movement, the NAACP, the National Urban League, uh, Congress of Racial Equality, known as CORE, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SNCC, and dozens of local organizations across the country have adopted platforms denouncing violence, lynching, and police brutality. The Durham Manifesto, written in December 1940, by a group of more than 50 black leaders who met at North Carolina College, now NCCU, called for an end to police brutality and the passage of anti-lynching legislation. So acts defined as group police brutality have initiated a number of race riots across the country protests and acts of civil dis dis uh, disobedience over the years. Riots that occurred in Los Angeles in 1965, in Detroit in 1967, in New York in 1967, all were attributed to police brutality. The beating of Rodney King in 1991, the shooting of unarmed Laquan McDonald 16 times in 2014 by Chicago police the senseless killing of Breonna Taylor by police, the even more senseless killing of George Floyd, and the destruction of far too many other black bodies by the force of the state is in many ways a continuation of an ongoing theme of which the Wilmington Massacre was a part. So much has changed, but little has changed. 
Much has changed, but little has changed. And so the beat goes on, as we say. A lack of legislation over the past 120 years at both the federal and state levels has only exacerbated the violence. Several Southern states passed anti-lynching legislation during the, uh, the late 19th century, including North Carolina. North Carolina's bill passed in 1893 was highly ineffective. The lynch victim, now understand this, the lynch victim had to be in the hands of law enforcement officials in order for a lynching to have occurred. So the person allegedly committed a crime, a black man, and was taken from a jail and lynched, then individuals could be prosecuted for such. But if the individual committed a crime, allegedly committed a crime, committed a crime, and that individual went home and was dragged from his home, then that stood outside the realm of the anti-lynching law, so that was not considered a lynching. And even though the 1893 law was in place in North Carolina, no one was arrested in North Carolina for participating in what George H. White called lynching deeds until 1906 in Salisbury, North Carolina. And that man was Henry Hall. Congress has failed to pass comprehensive federal anti-lynching legislation, even though 200 bills have been introduced, including a bill by North Carolina Congressman George H. White in 1900. You know, George H. White sought to actually make lynching a capital offense, but his bill sweetly died in committee. And now the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill is before Congress. It passed in the House of Representatives, but is being held up in the Senate. In addition to the anti-lynching bill before Congress, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act has been introduced to combat police misconduct, excessive force, and racial bias in policing. But you know, often when we look at the dismal aspects of the African-American experience in terms of the awful, you know, the bizarre, the violence, we must also look at resilience, organizational and institutional formation, formal and informal, the black church, fraternal organizations, and businesses that emerged by the time of the Wilmington Massacre. In 1900, there were 20,000 Black businesses in the United States. 14 years later, there were 40,000 Black businesses. So in the face of violence, Jim Crow legislation, individual acts of discrimination, in your face racism on a daily basis, Black troops who fought for this country returning home to face unspeakable horrors because they dare wear a uniform representing the armed forces. In the face of all of this, we can say the folks are still standing, the Black community is still standing with everything that has been thrown coming in 1619 with 20 and today well over 40 million. So where do we go from here? For our teachers, for our principals, for Americans in general, where do we go from here in terms of this violence that seems to be so much a part, it's part and parcel to our existence? How do we, how do we deal with this? It rests upon our shoulders to come up with other strategies to deal with our issues. That's it. Oh, I kind of
of just want you to preach a little bit, Dr. Parker. <laughs> so um, I appreciate those words. And I'm actually going to ask Lee Ray, hopefully she's caught her breath a little bit, to come back on and join us again as well. Um, because based on what you just said, Dr. Parker, um, there's a couple of questions that have come through the chat. And I want to ask them straight up, up front, so that we don't lose time because there's a million great questions coming through. But look, this is it. Um, Tina is asking what so many teachers have said in the pre-questions and are saying is how to teach, and we'll talk more about this in the pedagogy session later, but I wanna hear from you guys too on this. How do we teach and confront this in this political climate that attacks hard history and controversial topics in social studies as revisionist history, that it's a false narrative, that you are being anti-patriotic, that you are demeaning the moral character of this great nation by covering this hard history. Um, Esther also um, pointed out that there was a very detailed display about ACOC at UNCG Memorial Auditorium. Um, the university has since renamed the ACOC building. And while the acts of these men were egregious, how do you teach about the historical facts and the emotional sentiments without denying young people's humanity? So, you know, we might be shaming their parents or, or whatnot. So I'm just really interested to hear, starting with you, Dr. Parker, Parker, because I know you tell it how it is. Um, I'm interested to hear from you guys on what do we say to our K-12 teachers who are really struggling with this? I mean, for someone who has been, been doing this for more than 40 years now, um, and, and you hope that you're teaching truth, I mean, nothing beats truth. Um, I think we have to be very careful about uh, stepping on people's toes. That is, you have to step on toes at times. Uh, truth does that. Um, and I, I think it's important, uh, I mean, I have I've always tried to tell the truth based on the surviving evidence. I mean, you can't go out there and just say things. Uh, you have to rely <laughs> on, you, you have to do the, if, I mean, we're t as teachers, uh, as professors, uh, as researchers, uh, as, as David and Loray are, I mean, we actually base our teachings on very sound evidence. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do that, I, I think you're covered. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've been covered, you know, more than 40 years because I have based, even though sitting in the classroom when I was a very young 24, 25 year old and students sitting in front of you would love to have heard more about black rap than actual black fact of black history. You know, you have to, to tell them that there's a difference between what you think, what you heard, what you believe, mm -hmm. and what is, what is real. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is uh, it's important that we tell the truth based on extent information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, primary source documents, teachers know, uh, are so important for that. We're going to uh, share some of those in the follow-up resources, some particular sites for primary source documents. Um, David and Lee Ray, do you have anything else you want to say about that? You know, one of the things um, I know teachers, you know, this idea that you are indoctrinating or being biased um, by teaching a full and complex comprehensive history. You know, again, I think so much of it is about intentions that we, I think we are where we are today because we haven't faced anything to heal from it, right? So we're still kind of reeling. Um, Lirae and David, what are your thoughts um, about what teachers, you know, what do you think when they, they face the, this pushback from parents or from principals or from the community? Um, that you're indoctrinating students, that you're, you know, don't don't talk about that sad stuff. Ray? I I follow in with Dr. Parker. Let's it's just the facts. And yeah. if you read my book, the footnotes and endnotes are a substory of documentation of conclusions and ideas and thoughts that got me to where I was in the narrative. And so fully acknowledging the truth of the tragedy of history 
will help us all understand it better. Mm -hmm. I'm not a teacher. I bless teachers. I love teachers. And I appreciate yes. all that you do to take this history, this really heavy stuff yes. that we give you, and make it understandable for our future students because I like David grew up in Eastern North Carolina and had never ever heard of what happened in 1898 mm -hmm. until I went to college and even then it was a minor footnote to the full story of um, 20th century North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So starting with truth and moving from there and great folks like you Christy help them <laughs> learn how to take all of this heavy stuff and disseminate it in a more understanding talk sort of way because yeah. it's not just african-american history it's not just north carolina history it's our history and it has to be a scene as a whole to understand who we are now and where we need to go and those things yeah and i think it's important too what's talk a little bit more about this later when we get into pedagogy, but um, this call for neutrality in the classroom, I really want teachers to think about that and think about what's being asked when you are asked to be neutral in the classroom. I think that call itself is a very politically motivated call. Um, you know, we're not saying go out and tell students who to vote for, right? That is a political, a type of, you know, politicalness that you want to keep out of the classroom. But to teach a full history, a full comprehensive history, um, there is nothing bias about that, right? So we have to do that work and kind of push back against this idea, um, you know, of neutrality. You know, if you think about it, teaching is political. Every textbook, as David um, talked about himself, every textbook, every curriculum, every new revision of the standards, it's all informed by culture and certain people. So, you know, and I'll share a couple of articles with you guys about this too, but it is political because life is political, right? So no, don't tell your students who to vote for, but we do have to get in here and really teach this full and comprehensive history. Um, so I wanna get into uh, some questions. There's so many, so many, you know, teachers, they ask the best questions and we don't have a lot of time here, but, um, have a teacher who's asking about the formation of the fusion party. How in the world did a coalition like that come to be? And in addition, Alex is asking, was there ever any attempts at reestablishing the fusion government? Can we get a fusion government back today? A few people have asked. Um, any thoughts on that from any of you? And if you're speaking, and you guys have to decide who's gonna answer. David is the man for that. <laughs> Uh, Reverend William Barber talks about reestablishing the uh, fusion coalition and so do lots of young people and, and uh, constantly. He, 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 you know, Reverend Barber rarely gives a lecture, uh, rarely preaches, rarely walks across the street without talking about the fusionist mm -hmm. uh, and, and their vision of, of interracial politics. Personally, I think he and my best friend Tim exaggerate the uh, racial harmony uh, of the uh, fusionist, uh, uh, and but it's unquestionable that they did something remarkable. That they were able to forge a political alliance uh, that uh, crossed racial boundaries at a time when that was really unheard of, and that's indisputable. Um, so, uh, it was done despite not having worked out all the racial problems at the time. It was done despite lots of white people, even in the coalition, being white supremacists. It wasn't like it was two perfect groups of people coming together. They didn't, you know, they weren't aiming for a nirvana of but they still said, we have these common interests and we're willing to reach for those common interests, having identified issues that would benefit both sides. Mm. Um, more emphasis on little d democracy, more people voting, uh, better schools, a broader social welfare system. Um, looking out for one's neighbor, 
those were issues that could bring, bring, bring people together. And um, uh, so. Um, Imagine a politics like that, that brings us together rather than focuses on what divides us. It's a novel idea, isn't it? <laughs> Right. And I think because it was so remarkable and radical at the time, it is easy to idealize them further. Mm. Um, I don't see that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and the white sides of the fusionist coalition uh, sold out African Americans uh, as soon as um, it was politi politically is after 1898, uh, when it was impossible to be politically relevant if you weren't white supremacist. I mean, it was impossible. I mean, you, you, would, you, you did not matter if you weren't a white supremacist. You would never hold any office anywhere. You would never get government contracts. You would never get nothing. They changed, they, they spun on a dime, you know, or left. They went, the Republican Party wouldn't even allow African Americans into their 1900 convention in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, was it radical, important, powerful, something to learn from? Yes. Um, but just like with all hard lessons in history, there's also this other thing like, how can we do what they did and better? <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, we've also got a lot of questions about, um, I think you guys have blown a lot of people's minds with the fact that this wasn't just Wilmington. You know, it's one thing that we don't necessarily know about 1898 Wilmington. It's another thing to not realize that this was a North Carolina wide campaign of white supremacy, for that matter, a Southern wide, because I know a lot of the, the orchestrators of 1898 were traveling into the deeper South to kind of uh, get advice and, you know, borrow playbooks from other states. So um, one question that I, I think is really interesting um, that folks are asking is, okay, we're in the late 800s here how was information spreading at this time? So how did, um, you know, Fernifold Simmons end up with a web across the state where you have, you know, 800 to 1,000 different, you know, white supremacy groups? Um, how was this information getting around so quickly for folks to even know what was happening? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is another two-hour talk, but... Um, <laughs> oh, no, here comes Speedy. <laughs> Essentially, there was um, Simmons in, in his network, and he was purposely buying newspapers, and he was using the telegraph system and the train stations. So these speakers would be train station to train station to train station, and the newspapers would run articles letting folks know when a speaker was going to be in their neighborhood. And telegrams across the South were useful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those were some of their first tools. Yes. Yeah. Do any of you know, you know, I find it's interesting because I've heard Leray, um, I mentioned to Leray a couple of weeks ago when we were talking that I keep hearing folks say, these are the most divisive times we've been in. We've never seen times like these. And then I push back and say, okay, well, Wilmington 1898, the Civil War, you know, their history is divisive. There have been plenty of moments like this. Um, but my fear is that we've never had a moment like this with social media and the echo chambers and um, the algorithms feeding you the type of nonsense that it thinks you want to hear. But then Lorraine smartly said, well, they had telegrams, right? So uh, they had, they were doing it in person. You know, they were meeting in churches and uh, Ruitson clubs or whatever the, the version of, you know, that was in the 1890s. Um, so has anybody, do any of you know, are those telegrams uh, collected anywhere? Are they available anywhere? You know, a lot of teachers are wondering about primary sources. Julia is asking, um, how do you research to find out if someone, um, you know, who was a member of these white supremacy groups and uh, find out more about the players? Sorry, I got coughing but oh, it's not you're good, you're good. <laughs> it's all allergies but um so there are some telegrams in collections spread across both state archives and 
collections at UNC and UNCW and places like that. And even um, President McKinley had a spy in Wilmington watching what was going on. <clears throat> and there are some telegrams in the McKinley collection as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are some starts, but they were proud of what they were doing in the white supremacy clubs and leagues and they were not covert in any way shape or form when they came out in support of the democratic party so you find articles in newspapers in every community where there's a white government union meeting or a red shirt rally and it will list the leadership in the local environment of those things and throughout southeastern North Carolina, all the way across the South Carolina border to Charlotte, you had strong red shirt presence. And you can find in the papers references to leaders who were riding through communities and were very proud of what they were doing. And it's in letters and diaries in every corner of the state where people were very much paying attention to what was going on in the white supremacy movement. So just a little bit of Thinking a traditional sort of research way in a community will probably turn up something. Right. Google is a great tool nowadays to find those things. <laughs> right. So every, you know, wherever you are, and uh, if for those of you in North Carolina, to check that out, that there's probably a telegram that came in or went out or something yeah. like that. Um, well, so, so, something Tim and I did when we were going around the state uh, talking about Wilmington in 1898 when our book came out as part of this tenure, is that when we weren't in Wilmington, we got tired of giving talks at places like Elizabeth City or Durham or Raleigh and having everybody uh, who attended uh, kind of look down their noses at Wilmington. Uh, so we, I mean, as if this was not, as if the issues, the racial issues that, that were not something that they had to deal with there. Instead, they would just sort of be shocked and surprised by what was happening in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. We got into the habit, and it wasn't hard at all, and it's even easier today with the internet, so much more available. We would show up two or three hours early, go to the public library. We know the dates when the, the massacre happened in, in Wilmington, and we would look for about a four or five day period in the local newspaper. There was always something. And they weren't trying to hide it. They were proud, of course, that not knowing the history, they knew what was happening. The white supremacists were proud of what they did. Mm -hmm. So you go to Elizabeth City, you find out that they blocked the four ways into town. They only let people that were going to vote white supremacists in. They watched them vote. They had already burned the local uh, black newspaper and they had already driven out the leading black activists and white activists out of the, out of the town. Um, none of which has ever been written about. Mm. And, um, and that's true in every, the, not those specific things, but that kind of thing, true everywhere. They weren't trying to hide. They weren't, it, it's, a, it's a good critical, teaching critical, you know, skills moment because in 1898 and 1900, Nobody's apologizing. Nobody's hiding the truth. Later they do. It's not revisionist history. They revise. Mm. They start putting up the historical markers. They start changing what's taught in schools. They start, they do this. So in a way you just have to unravel. You can go back to the primary sources. Nowadays, a lot of those newspapers are available online for no charge. Um, uh, so you can go straight. I found it one of the, uh, I love the sleuthing part of writing history. I love that. I love like being the detective on this thing. <laughs> when we did this work, it was almost not fun. I mean, it wasn't because they were so proud of what they did. It was on the front page of you know, News and Observer, white supremacy reigns triumphant. And everybody then rushed out with memoirs, many of which are now available online at the Southern Historical Collection at UNC Chapel Hill, where you can go, everybody wanted to write a little bit about how they were involved. 
because if you couldn't show that you were involved, it was like being a war veteran. You know, your political career was probably not going to go very far. So over the next 20 years, it was as if everybody, people that weren't born were involved practically, you know. So, and I think student, because you can do original research, that, that, that if, you're in, if you're in Fayetteville, which I don't believe anybody has written about much, or if you're in Roxborough or Asheville, students cannot just like be retracing what I did or Ray or Freddie, they can actually do original research on what happened in their community, which can then lead places. Like maybe they're surprises, maybe it played out in different ways, but they, they can break new ground, right. which I find students, students like to do that. Yeah. They like to be historians. Dr. Parker, yeah. were you gonna add? Yeah, I was, you know, I, for all of us who are assembled here, when you listen to, to David and Loray, you know, talk about what happened in 1898, 1899, 1900, and thereafter. You know, let's take history and make it live for us today. They were talking about voter suppression. I mean, voter suppression at the max. And what we see happening around us today is the same thing done in different ways. Exactly, so allow, well said. Let's allow yesterday to live with us today to enable us to, to make sure that what happened in 1900 doesn't happen exactly 100 years and 120 years later. Let's make sure that voter suppression, whenever we see it, in any color, in any badge, let's make sure that we defeat it and, and allow your, your teaching here today, because these are some wonderful lessons. Allow it to help you deal with where you are today. Yes, absolutely. Well, one point, um, people in 1898 had to register to vote prior to every election. And then their names sat on the rolls. And if anyone found fault with the eligibility of someone to vote, they could petition and have those names removed from the polls so that they couldn't vote on election day. And names were continuously struck from the polls um, before election day across North Carolina because they were accused of a crime but not convicted of a crime or they didn't live in the right precinct where they had registered to vote but they had tried and they couldn't register the vote in this precinct so they registered in that precinct so we see that today what was one of the states south of us they struck how many names from the rod right, the register so that people couldn't vote today in the presidential election so there's many different ways to physically and legally intimidate voters. Right, that's a great point. Um, I, I just saw this question, Rob has asked, are there any African-American primary sources that cover this period? And I think that's a great point. So much of this history, because you know the, the victors write the history, we have so many primary sources from, sadly, because they were so out in the open, the white supremacists, um, that side of things. So are there sources to go to for the black voice in this, you know, um, the Murrow of Tradition by Charles Chestnut, of course, there's a couple of novels, but other sources. And I want to roll that into a question about um, the families. So we know that, um, you know, several thousand people were uh, left in a mass exodus after this took place. We know some people were, you know, high ranking black leaders in the community were banished. Um, obviously, it's estimated anywhere between 60 up to 200 or even more people were murdered in the streets, black folks murdered in the streets. Um, so, you know, that's certainly kind of curtails having their voices today. But what can we go to for that? And then also, what became of those families? What is the legacy of Wilmington 1898 for those families? We have a ton of questions about have there ever been any kind of legal consequences for the perpetrators? Um, has there ever been any kind of restitution for the black families? You know, if you think about the, if you had a prominent black citizen 
the break in intergenerational wealth that happens, the post-traumatic stress, the trauma, and how that lives down through generations. That's a gigantic question I just asked the three of you. I apologize, but there's so many good questions and we're running out of time. Um, so what do you guys think? That was the charge given to us as the Wilmington Race Riot Commission was created by the legislature was to identify the causes, but mostly the effects, and specifically the effects on the African American community. We sort of had by 2000, 2001, three, we had developed narrative that the you know, this was a tragedy in Wilmington and we knew that uh, it was perpetrated by white supremacists and the African-American side, but um, what was that impact? And so that was my charge. And I really had hoped to find letters, diaries, documents, and things like that generated within the black community. And if they are there, they're still being protected and hidden because in Wilmington, I just, didn't find as much of that as I had hoped to find. And um, the way I came about many of the conclusions about the effects on the community, and these effects are short-term effects, not the 50-year scope of effects, because Wilmington as a city grew and changed with both world wars. And so I had to find a place to stop because I'd still be researching it right now. And um, if an African-American family owned property in 1897, by 1900, they're probably still owning it, although they may not be living in it. Hmm. If you were a tenant in 1897, you probably left the city and, and you're living in Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, places like that. If you were a day laborer, you probably left. If you were a business owner and had a storefront, in downtown Wilmington, you probably moved your storefront from downtown Wilmington to the internal African American community because your clientele changed from a mixed race clientele to just black purchasers. And those purchasers had less purchasing power because they were given lower wages, they were kicked out of having the more prestigious jobs. And so their wages were lower. That meant if you were a business owner, your income was lower. Too. So the economic status of African Americans in Wilmington went down considerably after, right after 1898 into the 20th century. Um, wasn't another black paper in the city until mid 20th century. And um, African American churches, they have had fires, so St. Luke's had a fire in the 1950s, and they lost all of their paperwork. And they owned the building where Manley had his printing press, and their building was destroyed as a result of the violence on November 10th. That is the only example of reparations given to the Black community as a result of the violence of 1898 members of the community came together and reimbursed that church for the lost building. The building was never built. It's a parking lot still today. So there's no built environment to help interpret and explain and give a base to that history. Even the church itself, it completely burned in 1950s. So the landscape doesn't even look the same. So there's, and you know, the commission, was created by the legislature sought to have some recommendations presented to the legislature to address um, helping the community move forward financially and in every sort of way and all of that died in committee in the legislature so the only thing that happened was an apology that the legislature failed to protect life property of North Carolina citizens mm -hmm. so yes there's work to be done there's descendants of people who um, were forced to leave, people who uh, were killed, those folks still live in Wilmington. The story has been buried in their families. We had a lady on our commission who um, was longtime resident of Wilmington. Her family had been there and she was asked to serve on the commission and she was proofing one of my chapters and she came across the name of a person she knew was in her family and he had been killed on November 10th, and she did not know that. Yeah. And she was, she had to come to grips with that internally and personally.
personally before she could move on with helping us do our work. So it's still being uncovered today. And I hope my work is a foundation to give others the ability to move past the basic narrative and get more of these deeper stories. Mm -hmm. um, not just in Wilmington, but as David and Freddie said, across the state. It happened in Wilmington. It didn't have to happen anywhere else in North Carolina because it did happen in Wilmington. And all people had to say is, if you want this to happen, what happened in Wilmington? We want that to happen here because we can do it. And nobody was held accountable. It, we'll do it, you know? And people in Atlanta in 1905 went to Wilmington. How did you do it? They taught them. So. Right. So we um, need to get ready to switch to our second panel here. But before we go, David and, and Dr. Parker, I would love um, just to give you a final moment um, to speak to the issue of hope. Um, Freddie, you got into this a little bit in what you were talking about, and David, actually you as well. But one of the things that I'm always telling teachers um, to really kind of push with their students is that hard history does not have to be hopeless history. Um, you know, that's a quote from Dr. Hassan Jeffries from the Teaching Hard History of American Slavery Report, that all through history, people have pushed back, they have resisted, um, but then we come to Wilmington and this was largely a huge win for white supremacy. And so where do we find hope to give to students when we cover this history, when we cover related themes, um, you know, how do we make sure as we're teaching our young folks that we're empowering them and talking about survivors rather than victims, um, that, we, that we just find that hope? What would you say to that in, um, you know, a final minute each? Freddie has wise ideas on this. What do you think, Dr. Parker? What you got for us? Closing sermon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, my study of slavery tells me a whole lot. Uh, it, it tells me that if people could endure uh, the horrific and ugly scars of enslavement, if, if I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and uh, not see the house until seven or eight o'clock that night, if, if I witness my wife being raped, if I witness my child being separated from me at age 16 and sold to somebody, if, if I endure whatever it is that, that slavery offered me on a daily basis, and I still have hope that one day this awful institution will come to an end, if I can go back and study those people and look at their tenacity and their fortitude and their hope and their faith that this thing will come to an end one day. If I can, can, can go back and study uh, black folks in the late 19th century, if I go back and look at the history of the Parker family in Northern Orange County and look at everything that they've endured down to the present time. And my father tells me that hope and faith brought him where he is. I mean, with, with all of that, with all of that ugliness, and, and they see beauty in it in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. With, with the, the, the great lives that we have today, you know, we, we might think that we complain about this, we complain about that, but relative to yesterday, we're living pretty well. And so uh, I have the hope that my father and my mother and my grandfather and my grandmother have given me that hope that they, get, they gave me. And I can take that, extrapolate it, use it in the classroom and, and, and teach my uh, students, and teach people with whom I have contact, you know, based on yesterday. So there's always hope. As long as you have some, some, some breath, uh, as long as you have a vision, uh, as long as you have faith that it's going to be better than it is to imagine if black folks during slavery times that just said, 
well, it ain't going to ever get any better. I don't have any hope. I don't have any faith. That would not have been the struggle to, to bring it to an end. Same with, with people fighting for civil rights yesterday and today. I think that folks out in the street today have hope that it will get better. And so that's my take on it. As long as I have breath, I believe that I, I can instill in someone that thought there's always going to be a brighter day. Struggle continues. Amen, Fred. Yeah, Dr. Sasalski, you want to say something, David? Well, I can't say it better than Dr. Parker just did. The most, the most important thing, uh, we, we cannot be more, less hopeful at the prospects for building better lives than people who were enslaved and people who survived periods like Wilmington in 1898. And just like with Freddie, I see it again and again. People found a way to be, to find, to find hope and to find strength and a general sense that a better time will come and to work toward that. And searching in our own lives for the sources, the strength, uh, the sense of, of human possibility, um, I think is something that we all have to do. In the classroom, no apologies for, for, for telling the truth about history. Children pick up when you're comfortable. Uh, we're all, we're, we're taught, we're taught facts and truth all the time in a hundred situations uh, when we're in the classrooms. And, um, uh, we have to lean into telling these stories and as, as the truth that they were. And, um, and I think young people appreciate that. Oh, so that's what the world was like. Okay. Now we know you came out and said it. What's next? And finally, um, I know I certainly found this when I was, I used to write a oral history column for the Sunday news, uh, Raleigh News and Observer. And I knew that, that I couldn't just, every week, I, I couldn't write a story about a lynching. I wrote stories about lynching. And I went to, you know, and at that time, the News Observer audience re reached a lot of people that didn't, did not want to hear that. Or other similar things. But I did make sure that the next time I leaned into the beautiful side of life, which is also abundant. You know, I, I reached into the, the joy of gospel music or the or quilting or all kinds, you know, um, moments of interracial cooperation, even if they were little small moments, but things that, things that show that there is, history is a broad thing and, and we all need sustenance, positive examples. And then a week or two later, I would come back and darn it, they get, they, they get people running over striking workers at, you know, the lumber mill uh, in 1953. Um, and um, so I, would, I guess I would just bear that in mind in the, in, in, in the classroom. Um, I think we can, um, uh, I think we owe ourselves and young people uh, um, both the, the <laughs> the hard truth and 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 the the moments of our past that show a broader and and more hopeful uh, um, and more beautiful, more poetic, more joyous side of humanity's experience, and it's yeah. always there. That's right. Great, David Soselski. Thank you so much, Lee Ray Umfleet. Thank you so much, Dr. Buddy Parker. Thank you so much. We appreciate the three of you being here with us tonight. Um, and, you know, I just want to, again, make sure all the teachers know how much the three of you especially really do appreciate teachers. And every time I've asked any of you to do something for teachers, you're like, we are there, right there, because you really do. I know it. Door so thanks to all three of you for being with us. We have a million more questions, so I'm sure some people are going to be getting to you, but we thank you for your time and for being here with us this evening. So My pleasure. Great to work with you again, Lorraine, Freddie. Always great. Always so, good to see y'all, David.
Take care. Everybody Crystal. else stay with us. Um, we are going to take, we're going to have a quick five minute break, a musical interlude um, for all of you that you can watch and listen to. Um, we have artist Jay Rowdy. Uh, when we asked a couple of artists um, their response to Wilmington 1898, they put together a few songs for you guys. So we're going to play about five minutes of a performance, their performance here for you. And then we will pick up with our pedagogy panel and as soon as this ends. And so if you want to grab something to drink, stretch your legs or dance along with these great artists, um, I'm pleased to have and welcome Jay Rowdy. Thank you. What's going on, y'all? Welcome tonight. I'm so excited to be here with y'all. Look, I love teachers. I'm an educator. I'm a teacher myself and have so much respect for what y'all are doing, especially covering the history of Wilmington. Uh, my name is Rowdy Rousey, uh, and this is Black Royalty. Let's get it. Yeah. This is Black Royalty. Yeah. And we are Black Royalty. Yeah. This is Black Royalty. Yeah. Come on. Come on. The Prince. The Prince. And we are Black Royalty. And we are Black Royalty. Hey. Come on. Yeah, the prince high in the hill, find the way his way home. The black space cat and rapping dog, I'm back in my zone. Whenever God hit up my line, I finally pick up the phone. He's the black boy, Jedi, whooping wet ass clothes. I'm making rock my way through drone while I'm booking so and wrong. Yeah, my mama said her baby looking strong. Can I do no wrong? Well, maybe I can't, but recognizing that the truth is strong. We in, pencil to pen, perfect position to pinpoint like my insulin. After a show, when you know your boy getting it in, count all my wins. myself, as is my wife, so really happy to be a part of this.
All right, hopefully you got to stretch your legs a little bit and now we're going to move on to um, the last part of our program where we're going to look at pedagogy. Um, and because we're running a little bit behind, as is always the case, it's what teachers do, um, we'll probably go maybe about 10 minutes later than 7.30, but you know, um, obviously do what's best for your grumbling stomach at whatever time. Um, so now I'm gonna invite uh, some amazing educators on screen to join us. I'd like to welcome Dr. Lisa Buchanan, Dr. Kara Ward, um, Corey Greer Banks, and also Crystal Reagan, who you met at the beginning of the program, the Education Section Chief of the North Carolina Museum of History is gonna come back on and join us. She's a former teacher and a former administrator, so she brings some good perspectives too. So let me tell you a little bit about these fabulous educators uh, that are with you right now. Dr. Lisa Buchanan is an Associate Professor of Education in the School of Education at Elon University. Her teaching spans elementary methods, social studies and children's literature, and seminars on equity, leadership, and classroom management. This is her 20th year in the classroom. She must have started teaching when she was five. Dr. Buchanan's research is primarily focused on pre-service teachers' beliefs about how to teach contentious topics, and she's regularly published about the use of film and children's literature for teaching contentious topics. She's co-editor of Reimagining Elementary Social Studies, a Controversial Issues Reader. And Dr. Kara Ward teaches a variety of elementary and secondary education courses at the Watson School of Education at UNCW Wilmington. She served uh, in the public school system of North Carolina since 2000. She was named the High Trask High School Teacher of the Year in 2007. Her various roles in education include a social studies teacher, national board certified, K-12 lead teacher for social studies, instructional leader for the North Carolina Virtual Public School and project director for a Teaching American History grant. I really miss those. Uh, her research focuses on various topics in social studies education, including the use of history labs to teach historical thinking skills and how racialized violence is addressed in curriculum standards. Dr. Ward's work has been published in Social Studies and The Young Learner and the Journal of Social Studies Research. And last but not least, Corey Greer Banks was raised in Dayton, Ohio, 
and Virginia Beach as a self-proclaimed military brat, but she also has lived in different parts of the country and in Germany. She graduated from the University of Maryland uh, in Germany with a BA in history, received her MA in English from Old Dominion in Virginia. She is a voracious reader. She loves books about history and social justice. Her heroes are Eleanor Roosevelt. James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, and Toni Morrison. She loves to travel and immerse herself in unfamiliar places. She's been a teacher for almost 20 years. She started when she was two, evidently. And she's starting her fourth year at the Explorer School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you all for being here with us this evening. And I believe Lisa and Kara are gonna get us started with some tips and tricks for how we actually do this work in the classroom. Take it away, guys. Thanks for being here. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for having us. Um, Lisa and I are so pleased to be here with you. This is such a stellar um, a group that we have tonight and uh, certainly some hard acts to follow um, from earlier. We, we also love to talk, so we will try not to, to ramble too much, but hopefully we'll share some ideas with you that you can take to the classroom. We obviously also love teachers. Um, we have chosen to uh, work with teachers as our, our career, not only as teachers ourselves, but now in getting our future teachers ready for the classroom. So we are really pleased to be here with you tonight. Um, we have so many ideas and such a short time with you tonight that we are going to share this, um, these slides from this presentation with you afterward. Um, and we also have some other resources at the end of the presentation that we won't have time to get to tonight, um, but we do want to make sure we share those with you. So I'm going to get us started with a look at how we use history labs, which Christy mentioned in the introduction. Um, and then Lisa is going to talk to you a little bit about the language we use to teach events like 1898, and she's going to relate that to Tulsa. Um, and then she'll share some additional resources. Um, so let's, let's get us started. Um, first of all, this is an image you saw earlier that Larray talked a little bit about, um, a very common image um, of 1898 out in front of the Daily Record after it was burned. Um, Lisa and I discovered when we worked at UNCW together, she's now at Elon, but when we were at UNCW together, um, we noticed with our students who came there, many of whom were raised in North Carolina and some even in the Wilmington area, many of them had never heard of this event. And we wanted to find a way to do that in a very meaningful way in the classroom. And so one of the things we love tonight, we were texting each other back and forth as David and Freddie were talking about, um, you know, looking to the evidence and being sleuths and finding all the really rich things in primary source documents. And Lorray talked about this also. That's exactly what we wanted to do. So we decided to use a history lab approach because we could not, th this was a way that we could share a lot of details um, from sources, but we could also share these multiple perspectives. And we felt this was especially important in a piece of hidden or hard history like 1898, where there was this, one narrative that was told for a long period of time and we didn't hear other voices for many, many years in our history textbooks and in other sources. So we really wanted to um, cover it in a meaningful way and we decided to use a history lab approach. Um, we first learned about this approach from a social studies colleague in the local school system here. And as you can see here on the slide, uh, and we know many of you have probably used this, but we're gonna explain a way that uh, kind of how we, um, we use it, because I know we all might use some, some various um, versions of this, um, but it is an inquiry-based classroom activity. It's based largely on the work of Bruce Lesh. It involves primary and secondary source analysis and really um, gets students to read, instead of just vertically from the top to the bottom of a document, gets them to read laterally and read across sources find out who wrote the source um, or, or who took the picture. What year did it take place? How does it compare to other documents? So looking kind of like um, tabs on a web browser, looking across um, so that this activity really gets students to do that. History and labs include three things, questions, which there's one overarching compelling question as well as some supporting questions, sources, which are teacher selected primary and often secondary sources, and then answers, which the students come up with. They look to the evidence to get those answers. Uh, we loved, we, we noted earlier um, when Freddie said, um, we need to tell the truth based on surviving evidence. And so we really do want students to look at that evidence to come up with those answers. So teachers can use these history labs to examine historical events or figures. And also we've worked with teachers to develop um, labs about more contemporary issues, about controversial issues. 
So just really briefly, we want to talk a little bit about um, justifying the use of history labs. There are two main reasons that we find these to be particularly useful. I know some of the text on this chart might be a little small, but when you get the copy of this, you can find the link um, to the source online and you can also kind of zoom in and see it up a little bit closer. Um, um, but historical thinking skills, we feel that history labs are a really effective way to teach these. And going all the way back to Sam Weinberg's work in 2001, um, in his book, um, Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts, he talked about the importance of these skills. And so his work uh, through the Stanford History Education Group, they have developed some really great tools for teachers to use. And we find this chart in particular to be really helpful when developing labs. Um, that are going to teach those skills. So the first column there includes just, just some of the historical thinking skills that we want to teach to students. The questions column is really great because this can help us develop questions for our students about sources. And then we love the prompts because when students are developing their evidence-based answers, we can point them to these prompts as ways that they can frame their responses to the questions. Um, if you want to know more about historical thinking skills, I know many of you are familiar, but if you want to know more, we do have a video linked at the end of our presentation where you can watch and learn more about that. So the other reason that we think using history labs is really effective is very current and relevant. Um, as most of you probably know, our current, our social studies standards are currently under revision on the state level. And in the most recent draft, um, which is pretty close to being finalized, um, in draft three, all of the K-12 social studies courses, except for the new economics and personal finance course, include a new inquiry strand. This is based on the work of the National Council for the Social Studies, their um, development of the C3 framework in recent years, and a spinoff of that is the inquiry design model. So these six bullet points at the bottom of the slide here are all components components of the inquiry design model. And what we love about using history labs is those first four bullet points very naturally occur when you conduct a lab with students. And Lisa and I would like to note here that depending on the follow-up assignments that you might do for a lab, you could even address the fifth and sixth bullet points. You're definitely going to ask questions, get students to examine sources, and get them to use evidence to make claims but you also may get them in follow-up assignments to do some writing or maybe even take some action on what they've learned. So now that we know what we, what I've explained what Lisa and I do with students and I've explained kind of the justification for it, I wanna walk you through a lab that we have used with students. So a, a couple of notes about this. Um, I do wanna say there are so many documents related to 1898. We don't want you to feel confined to just the sources that we present here. We were very excited because many of the sources that we're gonna show you were mentioned earlier um, when our scholars spoke. Um, but we want you to see this as kind of a framework or an outline that you could very easily substitute some other sources in. If you find a source about 1898 that really interests you, we're hoping you can easily fit this in here. Um, we have used a variety of, we've used photos, some excerpts from text pieces, some charts, a quick film clip, some maps, um, and we're going to go through them pretty quickly tonight. I, I feel like I'm going at warp speed with these, but we just want to introduce you and just get you to think about some possible sources that you might use. Um, if we were meeting in person, we would get you all into groups and get you to really dig in and explore these sources like we would with students. But instead tonight, we're just going to walk you through. So um, first and foremost, starting with our compelling question, um, we asked students, what is the lasting impact of the 1898 Wilmington coup? We heard earlier tonight um, from three people who have studied this in such detail that this is definitely connected to today. So we want students to be able to make those connections. And through three supporting questions, we, the framework we've provided is sort of a before, during, and after approach. We want them to look at what happened leading up to this, what happened during the event, and what the lasting impact is. And we feel that's important because this is such a complex event. Um, we, both of us, are still learning all the time new things about it, so we liked using this before, during, after as a way for students to frame their thinking. So, getting into those supporting questions, first and foremost, what were the events that led to 1898? So, many of these are from Larray's book. Um, Christy showed you the cover of that at the beginning of tonight, A Day of Blood, um, and she, she mentioned or made reference to some of these things, so we did just want to mention that. 
Um, this is an image from the book that actually shows white supremacy banners. These are hung along the, or were hung along the wharf in Wilmington around this time. Um, we think this is a very compelling um, source for students to examine. They'll probably make some connections to today and some symbolism that is being used today. But it does really kind of set the tone for what was happening at the time. After that, we like for them to look at just some small digestible pieces of some larger documents. We have linked up in the presentation the full document, if you would like to look at those for a little more context. But we feel with students, it really helps just to pull out some small pieces. So Rebecca Felton's speech uh, was what you, many of you have probably heard of Alexander Manley's editorial that he wrote that actually ended up to him fleeing Wilmington for his own safety. But this was the original speech that he was responding to. And you can see in here, she's very, um, she is very much in favor of lynching. Um, it, it's really very scary to read her words and see how much she supported this. Um, even though she was a suffragist and a big supporter of women's rights, um, she thought that lynching was, was a kind of solution to what she saw as a race problem. So Manley responded to this, and you can see here that Manley used some really strong language. He talked about, um, he, he called people hypocrites. He said that white men were crying aloud for the virtue of your women while seeking to destroy the morality of ours. So we feel that students reading these really compelling, um, this compelling argument and reading these strong words is a really powerful exercise for them to go through. The next question we like them to examine is what happened during the event? And so we have two sources here. One was mentioned earlier. We were very excited to hear this talk about telegrams, kind of the social media of the time. This is one of the McKinley telegrams. This was actually sent. We were so surprised when we first saw this because we often, for years and years, we didn't hear much about 1898, but it was so important. You can see the date on here, November 10th. So important at the time, you can see the word situation serious. This was sent to the President of the United States to alert him to, as to what was going on in Wilmington. So a very powerful um, document to be used. And then we have a map. This is a, um, I know this is very small where it is. I'm, I'm gonna zoom into the inset here in just a minute. This is in Larray's book. And if you look at it as a paper copy, like if you're to use in the classroom a paper copy, students can view a little more of the detail. I know this is rather small, but I feel it is really powerful. Um, it shows the location where blacks were killed and wounded on November the 10th, where whites were wounded. And you can also see the arrows showing the flee of black citizens from town. So this is, and, and as you look at the images and, and view the key, you can tell that this was very one-sided. So another really powerful image. We also like to talk to students about the economic impact of the 1898 coup. We have a brief clip that we use from Wilmington on Fire, where William Darity from Duke University talks about the impact um, economically. I'm gonna show just a very brief, about a, a 30 second to maybe a minute clip, just so you can get a sense of what he's saying. John Hamilton and I did a study as a contribution to the Wilmington Riot Commission's investigation where we measured something that we refer to as an occupational status score and we tried to estimate that for workers in Wilmington prior to the riot and after. And so we compared once again 1897 with 1900. And so, uh, uh, Prior to the riot, uh, the occupational status score for blacks was uh, virtually twice as high as it was after the riots. So there was a substantial change in the occupational distribution, a uh, heavy drift towards lower status jobs and, uh, and, and a growing absence of blacks and higher status jobs. So that clip actually goes on to in a lot more detail where um, he, he gives some real specifics about what things look like economically um, for people in Wilmington, especially for the black community. Um, and so we like to follow up with this chart and especially point students toward the total numbers at the bottom. Um, where you can see this very significant decrease between 1897 and 1900 in the total number of jobs for Blacks 
and then jobs for whites increases. We also like them to get, uh, we like to get them to look at the specific categories and see any trends in particular jobs that might have changed. Um, we like to follow that up with a look at race, um, the population by race. Um, you can see between 1890 and 1900, according to the census, something happened. You know, even if you don't, aren't familiar with the event of 1898, you can see that there's definitely this change. While a seemingly upward trend of both demographic groups, all of a sudden there's this decline from 1890 to 1900. Comparing that to North Carolina, you can see it even more because the trend is upward for both. So going back one quick slide to the Wilmington one, you can see that there's definitely an impact on the population. So that's just a quick run through uh, of some of the sources we use. We wanted to make a quick note because we know many of you you are teaching in a digital world. Some of you are face to face. We don't, uh, we want to encourage you not to view history labs as like a packet of documents just to give to students and turn them loose, but to provide some guidance. And so we know a lot of you are teaching online. So if you're teaching synchronously and you have the availability to do something like breakout rooms in Zoom, we encourage you to put, uh, assign a different supporting question to diff, uh, three rooms and then give students those documents to analyze and then they can come back into the whole room and debrief one another. If you do a whole class Zoom, you can present documents one at a time and then have students, you can ask them questions and have them reply in the comments. If you're asynchronous, you can put all of your documents and questions in a Google Doc and have students use the comment feature to analyze and respond to one another. You can use discussion boards in learning management systems like Google Classroom or Canvas and start a new thread for each of the sources you have. Or you can use a tool like Flipgrid and have students record their analysis of a source and respond to one another. So I, I know, like I said, I know that was super fast, but we wanted to make sure we showed you an example of how we cover this. I am now gonna turn it over to Lisa, who's gonna talk about the importance of the language we use in teaching these types of events. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for being with us tonight. Um, we know this is a lot of information. And um, as Christy mentioned before, this is uh, recorded for you to be able to go back and, and uh, walk through, especially like the slide that Kara just um, shared to think about how we can do this digitally and also face to face. Um, and so what I'm going to sort of move us into now is talking about why language matters when we talk about acts of racial violence. And so um, as Lorraine pointed out earlier tonight in our opening and also um, David mentioned and then Dr. Parker looked at as well, there's a variety of language that has been used to describe 1898. Um, and we recognize that this language has shown to vary based on who the speaker or writer is. Um, so we wanted to bring in some parallels to the Tulsa massacre that uh, Dr. Parker mentioned earlier, because this use of language um, in the variety of language that's used is also true for the Tulsa massacre as well. Um, depending on the amount of instructional time that you have and what standards you're wanting to address um, in your grade uh, or your course in secondary, um, we wanted to give you some ideas of ways that you might expand the work of 1898 to look at other um, uh, acts of racial violence that have occurred in the United States. And so um, there are a lot of connections to Tulsa here and also to Rosewood that we'll mention as well. Um, I also wanted to bring us back to the overarching question that Kara shared at the beginning of what is the lasting impact today? Because this um, question that we're gonna look at now about why does the language used to describe 1898 and racial violence in Tulsa in 1921 matter, um, there is a lasting impact of the language for today. <clears throat> so um, in the first slide here, I just want to point you to that at the bottom, um, and you'll, of course, as uh, Kara said, you get access to the slideshow as well, but you'll see linked 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre online exhibit. And so if you have the time and you're working with a number of standards for a study like this, then we encourage you to actually use the um, online exhibit that's prepared there by um, the Tulsa um, Historical Society and Museum. Um, but the material on this first slide is drawn directly, so we want to credit that source. Um, so in these two slides, I'm going to um, discuss the role of language and how 1898 has been documented and 
bring that parallel to Tulsa. So in this first slide, I want to bring your attention down to the two definitions, riot and massacre. So the definition of riot is the tumultuous disturbance of the public peace by three or more persons assembled together and acting with common intent. Massacre is described as the act or an instance of killing a number of usually helpless or unresisting human beings under circumstances of atrocity or cruelty. So in those two definitions, you can see a very uh, large difference in what the meaning of both of those are. So it is true, it is documented over time across sources that both the Tulsa massacre and uh, the Wilmington massacre have been referred to in a variety of ways. You'll note that depending on who the speaker or the writer is, sometimes the term riot is used. So I wanna bring your attention um, I'm actually going to bump down to the second slide. Um, and so you heard from the speakers tonight about the um, the uh, estimated number of lives lost, the loss of businesses, um, the loss of um, just economy and lasting impacts of that. But I want to bring your attention to the description of loss in Tulsa. So this is from historian Linda Christensen, who writes about, um, she's part of a group of historians who, who wrote about a number of um, acts of racial violence um, that are underrepresented in curriculum um, through a um, series called Burned Out of Homes in History. And she says, the term race riot does not adequately describe the events of May 31st through June 1st, 1921 in Tulsa. She goes on to um, describe the assault um, was met by a brave but unsuccessful armed defense of the community by some Black World War I veterans and others. So when we think about that language, that seems to align with the term massacre. She goes on to give the statistics, the estimated statistics. During the night and day of the riot, deputized whites killed more than 300 African Americans. They looted and burned to the ground 40 square blocks, including 1,265 African American homes, hospitals, schools, and detained, and churches in 150 businesses. And then goes on to talk about the number of um, people who were detained. Um, and how many people were left homeless. And so this sort of summary of the events of Tulsa has a really strong parallel, we think, to what happened um, in Wilmington. And as we do the work that um, Weinberg and others described that Kara mentioned earlier of reading laterally, looking across sources, students can then decide based on the language of these five sources, was this a massacre, was this a riot? What was this? We've established that it was a coup based on the events that happened in thinking about what a government is, but was it more than a coup? Um, so if you'll go back to that first slide, um, the massacre in Tulsa also um, has been described in thinking about um, uh, ways in which and who can benefit from the way in which it's described. So I would just want to bring us back to this because as you think about additional sources to add into your lab, you might want to think about the ways in which um, the lasting impact are described. So um, the Tulsa Historical Society says designate what happened in Tulsa, a riot prevented insurance companies from having to pay benefits to the people of Greenwood whose homes and businesses were destroyed. So again, we have this idea of who the speaker is, who the writer is, what their perspective. Um, and it was also common at the time for any large scale clash between different racial or ethnic groups to be categorized a race. Um, and so we just wanted to um, bring this in as part of this work of a history lab and especially in thinking about the lasting impact to have your students um, look at the language that is used, whether it's the headline, whether it's the caption of a historical photograph and how it is um, placed in a historical society um, collection of documents. Um, and also in the retelling, the secondary and tertiary sources about events like 1898. We feel that um, looking at the language that's used um, is important um, in what Dr. Parker was talking about, about relevance for today and how events are described, um, how they are documented, and then what is memorialized from that. Um, the next thing that I wanted to do um, is to mentioned that Dr. Uh, Ward and I are very open to people contacting us to learn more about how to use labs, particularly for 1898. 
Um, and so here's our contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and then also here in the end, um, not only because of time, but also because we want to give you materials, depending on to what extent you would like to expand um, this work and to go back and answer that initial question of what's the lasting impact. Um, there's a slide that we have that talk, here it is, the current events related to 1898. So we've selected um, a handful here, um, but you may be familiar with um, the recent renaming of a local park um, in New Hanover County. Um, there's also um, documentation here for how um, 1898 has, there's actually been a memorial that's been erected um, in the news around that and also a, a marker locally. Um, and then also some reports from what we might think of as like sort of non-traditional um, K-12 education resources. And so actually how 1898 has been a part of um, more recent um, coverage of how history is told um, and retold in this idea of revisionist history. So we've compiled some materials there for you, depending on to what extent you would like to look at um, current day events and parallel to 1898. So please, if you have questions um, or if you wanna know more about any aspect of this from the, um, I, the, the role of teaching this in the classroom, we are more than happy to answer questions that you might have. So hi guys, hello. Um, I want to thank Christy. I want to thank everybody that came before me for laying this wonderful groundwork and making it easy for me. Also, putting a lot of pressure on me because I'm last. Um, and I want to thank all of the teachers out there because we are the boots on the ground and you guys have been in Zoom all day teaching and now you are here listening. So I just want to give a kudos to you for like hanging in there um, as we help to make this event in American history known to more people. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share an example of what we have used in eighth grade at Explore School to teach this event. So you're just going to learn exactly what, what we have been doing for the past three years. All right, let's do this. All right, so first, I would like to start off by saying um, that teaching eighth graders about this event is not easy at all. But as you guys have already learned, it's possible and it's very important. My advice is that it's taught best with company. That's right. why I'm showing you this picture of my colleague and my friend, Jesse. So I'm fortunate to teach at the Explore School where we embrace integrative, complex, and immersive curriculum every single day. And I've always had the support of administration since the eighth grade team first embarked on this study three years ago. So, this unit is part of the eighth grade humanities curriculum that I teach with Jesse Francis, and we embark on every part of our class as a partnership, every part. Our class combines American history and language arts, um, combining the very best of our talents, as you can see plainly by our credentials. Um, when we run into difficult conversations about this unit with parents and the larger community, it's easier and it's valuable to take these things on as a team rather than in isolation. It can be very taxing to take on these things by yourself. Um, the study of the 1898 Wilmington Massacre is much more engaged and vivid for eighth graders when paired with a novel. And for this reason, we teach this event using the novel Crow by Barbara Wright, a young adult novel that retells the massacre through the eyes of an 11-year-old black boy named Moses Thomas. So the novel includes a wealth of opportunities to infuse primary document study, character analysis, and different types of conflict. And it's much easier for our students to experience the events of 1898 through the eyes of a middle school child. They can identify with Moses um, rather than just present dates and a timeline of events. Um, Jesse and I pause often to discuss how it parallels to real life Wilmington in ways such as uh, we in depth study Alexander Manley, his newspapers, this is brought up in pro. Um, we read his whole editorial in the Daily Record, which was then um, the main publication for black residents in that region. Um, we read newspaper articles and primary documents of propaganda that was spread by Democrats to, point, to paint black citizens as inferior and dangerous 
in publications such as the News and Observer. And um, back earlier in, the, uh, in this webinar, you um, saw one of the political cartoons that was used in the News and Observer. Um, our students analyzed that same political cartoon as well. Um, another thing that is brought up in the book, we, we try to elevate um, Black voices, and this book does a good job of that. So um, one mentioned in the, in the book is the Millie Christine twins, and this is fascinating. They are a set of conjoined twins that was born during this time period in North Carolina, um, and once they, were, uh, once they were freed from slavery, they went on, learned several languages, they were exploited because they were conjoined, they played several musical instruments, learned several languages, they were leaders in their community, they traveled all over the world, and then they came back, bought their master's plantation, and lived in it. So I feel like the Millie Christine twins are like really fascinating. There is a great video short about them from w WRAL, and the kids really get into hearing about this. Um, of course, you know, we study uh, the government and politics of 1898, including Governor Daniel Russell, the populist and fusionist party, and the cooperation um, that was, that was uh, on the horizon for blacks and whites during the reconstruction period. So we start this novel directly after our study of the American Civil War, and it's our anchor text to help students understand reconstruction, the promise this offered for us, the violent end and the beginning of Jim Crow era. But before we even start the novel, Jesse and I engage in some language lessons because eighth graders may not even understand the word coup d'etat. So we talk about its origins. We talk about examples of it throughout the world, um, including the Nazi takeover of power. Now remember, they're coming from seventh grade, so they should have had world history. So they should have some familiar familiarity with some of these events. Um, the Nazi takeover of power, the Iranian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the Xinhai Revolution, the coup of 18 Brumaire, and our summer read is actually a long walk to water. So before we get into this book, they literally have already studied the 2019 Sudanese coup d'etat. Um, so these are just to name a few. And while we don't spend a ton of time on these um, global coup d'etats, we do think it's important for students to understand the meaning of the word, to set it on a global stage before focusing on a national lens here. And we're sure to emphasize that for a very long time, no one had thought that a coup d'etat occurred on American soil until very recently. Um, in fact, Jesse even um, has stated to the class often that she first learned of this Wilmington coup d'etat with me the very first time we taught it three years ago. So we also take some time to set the scene of the novel. So we very much, you know, set off that Wilmington was this bustling, thriving port town for all levels of society and races during the last quarter of the 19th century, that it was the state's largest city with a majority of the pop population being African American, that Wilmington was the center of African-American political and economic success. It was considered a symbol of black hope. Um, students, they get a keen understanding of Southern cities that saw a surge of black economic growth. And we make sure to tell students that this is only one example, um, that African-American growth could be seen in places all across the South, in places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Tulsa, even here in Raleigh and Durham. Um, and I like the fact that um, it was brought up that Alexander Manley was originally from uh, Raleigh. So for the past three years, and this is where I get really excited, for the past three years, the eighth grade team has taken students to Wilmington, North Carolina at the conclusion of our study of reconstruction and reading Crow. And we walk Wilmington in the path of the massacre. So before the experience, we group students into five to six and they're assigned roles. So one role is the navigator. And so the navigator, they have to carry all of my maps and they have to inform the students of upcoming stops. Really, this is just so, you know, I won't have a whole bunch of students asking me where the next stop is. Um, I just readily tell them, go ask the navigator. Um, we also have a recorder, reporter 
they have to write down details about the experience. They have to carry the booklet. They have to carry a writing utensil. They have to ask their team for input to answer the questions and then come back and report to me. We also have a materials handler, timekeeper. They have to carry copies of primary documents um, and disperse them among their group at each stop. We have the speaker and they have to have a loud voice and they have to speak excerpts of the novel and excerpts of primary documents at, at pertinent stops. And, you know, let me tell you, we bring, bring the White Declaration of Independence with us. We bring um, primary news clippings, all of it. And then finally, we have the photographer. And so the photographers have their smartphones and their job is to take pictures throughout the experience and upload them into a school Google Drive so that we can have a record of, of our experience from, from, from year to year. Um, and so these are some of the pictures that you see. And so these are all from students and we are at the places where these major events that you just heard about in the, in, in the previous panelists, we are at the Armory. We are at, um, on the corner of 4th and Harnett. We are at Thalian Hall. We are at the courthouse. Um, this is here on the steps of the Armory. And we have students reading um, primary documents and reading um, pieces of the novel. They are connecting with history. And so every year it's a tradition to visit St. Stephen's Church. Um, and this is where, you know, we get to really hear um, stories that have been handed down over the years from 1898. And we feel like it's a real treat for us to visit um, this place every year. Um, we take a picture in the sanctuary of the church with Cynthia Brown. And you see that is her right here, Miss Cynthia Brown. She is the church historian. And she, we come in, we have a snack with her. She tells us the story of the church's role in 1898. She talks about her grandmother and how she survived 1898 and how it was very difficult for her to talk about even years later. She talks about how family after that left Wilmington out of fear and intimidation. Um, and so we consider this a treasure that, that the church takes out their time um, and dedicates it to us every year. Uh, so uh, they also see officers and leaders, Black officers and Black leaders of Wilmington in 1896, two years before the massacre takes place. We feel like this is important. We feel like um, having Cynthia Brown tell her story is important. We feel like it's really important to elevate uh, people of color and their stories and their side of, um, of this tragic event. Event. Um, and so every year when we walk out of the church, we feel it's important to walk past this picture um, to acknowledge and, and, and give thanks to the Black leaders of 1896 Wilmington. Once we return to Raleigh, the students are assigned to write a raw reflection on the novel and their experiences while in Wilmington. And so reflection is a big core value of, uh, for us at Explorers, and we do this so often that the kids don't even bat an eyelash. They just do it automatically. Um, this is an example from a student in 2018. It's untouched. I looked at it and I was like, man, there's some grammar errors or spelling errors, but I, I, I wanted you to see it in its raw form. Um, the first paragraph is primarily a summary about the novel, so I'm only going to read the second paragraph, which is about the tour itself. So this student says, the tour was like another puzzle piece to go along the story. As we walk through Wilmington, I know that there is still hurt. Up upon the walls graffitied, it said, those who have the most are blind. We are not your slaves. That one really stuck with me because he could be talking about something else, but what if he wasn't? I saw more signs like stop the violence and so on. I also liked the fact how we, are, we were taking the same route as the mob did on that night. It just made me feel in the moment. Standing right in the area where the massacre happened is unreal. Now, besides the tour, just taking a walk, a, a walk around Wilmington was really relaxing. Besides the cold winds, it was nice to see Wilmington differently. It makes me feel stupid to think I walked past one of the largest cotton exchanges in the world. In all, it was fun and relaxing. Now as for the legacy of Wilmington Race Massacre, I honestly wouldn't have known if we didn't have this class on it. I guess it wasn't big enough for history books or to get word around. 
It really is an interesting story and I'm glad I learned it. The Wilmington Race Massacre should be known by more people to stop any future events like it. And last, I wanna leave you with this. The eighth grade team in Explorers itself, we, we always try to connect our history, really anything we do to current topics to make what is old and long time ago relevant for our students. So in the past, students themselves, they have chosen to connect the 1898 massacre to Black Lives Matter, gerrymandering, the um, North Carolina voter ID case, propaganda and bias in current media. Um, we've also hosted a film screening and panel discussion of the Red Cape, which is a 40 minute film that dramatizes the 88 massacre at the NC History Museum where Larray Sykes Umfleet was one of our featured and honored panelists. And that's how I met um, Larray. So all of this, all of this, the novel, the trip, the study, it occurs in the first three weeks of December. So before you ask me in the Q&A what that's gonna look like this year, I will say to you right now, you don't even need to ask me because I do not know, we don't know yet. But we do know that we want something like this to occur in some shape or form. So we ask that North Carolina wear masks, socially distance, and promote healthy standards so explorers can still go to Wilmington this year. All right, thank you. Lori, thank you so much. Um, and so, of course, we're at time because we're all teachers and we never have enough time. But before I let everybody go, and I have to say I am shocked by how many teachers we still ha have with us, like almost 150 folks are still with us. Um, and I know y'all are tired, but I do want to just um, ask just a couple of questions here before we all say goodnight of it, because there's one question that's come up over and over and over again um, from Anne, Alicia, Kim, Amy, and Chris just said this in the Q&A too. So, so many people are asking, how do we find the balance between I mean, not traumatizing students, especially students of color and black students, while showcasing the hard truths of white supremacy. How do we do that? Um, Corey, let's let you catch your breath. Crystal, do you want to weigh in on that? Because um, Crystal, as you all know, is a former teacher, former administrator, and I've heard you speak about this a little bit. What are your thoughts? So, um... I would start by saying, and I know this sounds a pretty abrupt and hard, but we're running out of time. So, um, uh -oh, gloves are coming off. Our kids are already traumatized, and, mm. and they are traumatized because they saw a knee on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes. Mm. Uh, they saw seven bullets bullets in the back of Jacob Blake. They are aware that. Breonna Taylor was shot to death in her home. Um, so, so we're living in a social media age in which kids are, you know, governing themselves, policing themselves, managing themselves, and they are coming to us as educators with questions. And some of those questions we can't answer from a contemporary standpoint, but because we are social studies and history teachers, we can kind of help guide them to this is why things are the way they are by teaching things from a historical standpoint. And so while I, I, I understand, I've, I'm seeing a lot of these questions regarding how do we deal with trauma and how do we deal with, you know, not being um, too blunt in terms of talking about violence. Um, but the first answer is our kids have already been exposed to that. And I think that in some ways we can soften the blow by helping them understand the legacy and the history of the violence that they are seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's part of our responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking in terms about a lesson that I taught, and I taught A Push, I, I taught American One, I've taught African American history, I've taught North Carolina history. And so uh, one of the things that, that we talk about in terms of Wilmington is what happens after Wilmington. We talk about the red summer of 1919. It doesn't just stop with a political coup d'etat and the massacre of Wilmington. This thing escalates, it grows from city to city. And, and we're dealing with you know, young African-American men who are coming from World War I. They have guns, they've seen the world, they've been loved by French women. <laughs> so 
Uh, we've got all of those uh, tensions going on and they're tired. And of course, it'll be the next generation, you know, black soldiers coming from World War II where this thing will explode into what we call the modern civil rights movement. Uh, but, but I think that kids and young people, they resent sugar-coated history at this point. Um, and, and I'm not asking anyone to be irresponsible when I talk to young teachers in particular. Don't be irresponsible. You, this is in the standard course of study. Um, this is part of North Carolina history. If you're teaching eighth grade, if you're teaching civics, African American history, A push, it, it, it fits. So mm -hmm. I think that I would challenge you to be brave and to not allow the idea of trauma to stop you from teaching the holistic truth. Mm -hmm. um, if you're concerned about parents and your administration, I can say in my experience, because I'm from Eastern North Carolina, I've, I've taught in parts of the state where you, you're gonna have some pushback. Um, but more than often, if you are prepared and if you know your content and you practice your lesson, if you're concerned about the controversy of it, more parents will thank you as opposed to parents who complain mm -hmm. because they want their kids to be prepared for the world that they are in and the world that they are entering. So. Um, that's my short spiel about trauma. I mean, we could do a whole session on trauma. That's good. We can do a whole session on a lot of this. But I think, you know, one of the things. Traumatized right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a good um, point that you bring up, though, is, you know, talking about teaching in the East. The fact is, is every classroom is different, right? Every classroom, every teacher, the demographic makeup, the relationship a teacher has with their students, the teacher's race, the student's race, those are all, all different things. So there is no magic wand to way for us to give you the answer to that but um you know i think that the hope is that you know do as well as you can and do no harm right so it's not just about the history we learn it's about how we make students feel while they're learning that history mm -hmm. um i want to let the others of you weigh in on this too you know there is a particular follow-up question to that that this is particular tough particularly tough if you have a class that is predominantly white with perhaps just a couple of students of color. And then that trauma can be even exacerbated because you don't know how the white students are gonna to react to hearing this and how they're then going to look to the student of color, the black student after hearing of, of this. Um, so I wanted to see, did any of the others of you have anything to weigh in on? Corey, have you experienced anything oh, like this? Yes, yes. Um, and so I, I do a lot, we do a lot of journaling, free writing before we start on a part of the novel because there's parts of the novel, especially when, you know, the tension starts to rise with red shirts. Um, we do a lot of free journaling and then we read those. They're private. They just come to, to Jesse and I. And so we can read that and we can see like, are our students experiencing trauma at this particular point in time? Mm -hmm. Also with parents, you know, I've had parents of color come to me and say, I don't want my child learning this oppressive history. And, you know, I used to, when I, in my younger days, when I was two, as Christy said, um, I used to say that, that um, they have to learn it and they do. And I still stand by that, but we must balance uh, the, what we see as oppressive and traumatizing history with um, elevating voices of strength and of hope. And there are plenty of examples of black people fighting back, of yes. black people leading in Wilmington, of Abraham black Galloway. Yes, of black Washington businesses Plus. thriving, of the architecture, which yes. is why I make it such a point to um, visit St. Stephen's AME Church every yes. year that we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And just so you all know, we also have a full curriculum guide for Pro that will be in the resource list that we sent you guys. Um, we also will be sending you some tips and tricks that talk about other ways that you can set yourself up for success. Depending on where you are, you might have to send a letter to parents to let them know what you're going to be covering. Make sure you let your administrator know. Um, if you're in a place where you think you're going to get a lot of pushback, you might set up a curriculum committee at your school where you have folks from the community, a professor, you know, folks basically to vet it and back you up because we do understand that this can feel very tricky depending on where you are and who you're teaching. Um, in fact, I'm trying to let y'all go, but you keep asking all these great questions. So, I mean, we can just stay here all night, but I do have to ask Michelle and several other people have asked this. 
how do we teach about white supremacy in a community where these groups are still very active and may have family members who are participants, you know, not necessarily, well, I mean, I think there are kind of modern day red shirts in, you know, various degrees. So do any of you have thoughts on that? You know, it's one thing to teach this in Chapel Hill or Durham. It's mm -hmm. another thing to teach this in Randolph County or Jackson County um, or whatnot. So who has thoughts on that? Get it, Crystal. Yeah, I, I think part of teaching white supremacy is not to teach it just in terms of violence. We have to talk about, you know, systemic uh, racism, institutional components of it, um, intimidation and fear, all rooted in maybe what may be an initially violent event and how that reverberates over generations. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we talk to our kids, most of them think about white supremacy in terms of the Klan or some sort of, you know, scary figure, but they're not thinking about it in terms of, you know, um, the economic troubles that many communities of color face, um, voting, other intimidating sort of factors. So I think we have to talk about white supremacy holistically mm -hmm. in all of its forms and not just something that is just some sort of ghostly thing from 1866 to the 1950s right. that had taken on other forms and, and talk to them about the ways in which it manifests, mm -hmm. things that are subtle, things that even some people of, of color today may not recognize. Yeah. Um, and so I think we have to talk about white supremacy in terms of what does it truly mean um, and what ways does it manifest and how is it evolved or morphed over time. Yeah. Um, so, so I would argue that you know, talking about that term um, is going to take a little bit of time in itself, particularly for, for high school students, um, if we're talking about some of these deep topics. But I think we have to move away from this thought that white supremacy is only about folks who are violent. And even today, we think about it in terms of folks who are showing up at protests with AR-15s. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's the, the minor part of white supremacy that we can see. Right. But what are the systematic mm -hmm. components Right. Um, that have created the environment that we see today. Right, right. I think that's a, a great point. And I would encourage all of you, this will also be in the follow-up resources, um, to go back our, one of our first programs, 1770 to 2020, um, that we did with Dr. Sonny Kelly. The conversation after that, we got into a lot of this. And, you know, Dr. Kelly talks a lot about, you don't want to shame and blame, you know, like none of us were alive then. So what are we going to do today to keep this history from repeating, right? Shaming and blaming and, um, you know, cutting folks, you know, that just makes folks kind of check out. So coming at it from, you know, Sunny says, call people in rather than call them out. But there were so many questions, like, um, you know, a lot of just worry about how to reach white students with parents who, um, you know, are, are not going to necessarily want their child learning about this, um, or, you know, it's overwhelming to explain racism and effects of racism in ways that are authentic. Um, you know, teachers say there, Susan, I'm constantly battling preconceived notions, especially in my largely conservative county. Um, anybody else have thoughts on that? Because it's one of the things that so many folks are saying and then I'm going to cut it off because I know these teachers are tired, but they keep asking these great questions. But um, any other final thoughts on that? I would say invite them in. Invite those, invite those conservative parents in. Um, when we go down to Wilmington, we don't take a school bus. We don't sign. The, the trip is ran by teachers and parents. So we actively solicit parents to drive. And these are parents who are from far ranging counties. And by law, many of them, most of them have never heard of this event. Mm -hmm. And so while we're at every stop, those roles that those children have, they're primarily teaching the parents. So I say, go back into these parents and, and, and teach them what this was all about. They've already read the book. We've went to the stop. They're like, why are we at this courthouse? I tell the kids, go, go teach the parents. You know, I'm not gonna do that. You teach the parents. So invite those, invite, the uncomfortable conversation, it extends beyond the students. You have to include the parents as well. And you have to be open to having that uncomfortable conversation. 
Mm, I love that. And letting them know up front, be prepared to be uncomfortable. You know, we'll send you guys some great um, information from Brene Brown, who talks about kind of the skills you can give your students to say, when you feel like this, know that it's because of this and do this. So you lean in rather than shutting yourself off, you know, to prepare them and kind of steal that thunder of get ready to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. That's key for this work. Um, Kara and Lisa, we're out of time, but I do want to ask this one last question because it's something that several folks are asking. At what grade do we cover this history? Um, you know, we have elementary school teachers all the way up to university educators. Um, obviously, I taught eighth grade, Corey teaches eighth grade, eighth grade and up, check. But we have a fourth grade teacher with us who's saying, you know, do I cover this? And if I do, what's age appropriate? Can you guys weigh in on that really briefly? And then we're gonna we're gonna let these poor people. I'll say go. a few words and then I know Kara has some ideas. Um, we were furiously shaking our head when Corey was presenting because many of the things that Corey shared can be done in fourth grade and fall right along. Um, we recommend Crow. We've done book clubs with Crow with local when I was at UNCW with elementary classrooms, fourth and fifth grade classrooms um, in the area. And so um, that as a book club title or a whole class read is a great um, connection. What I would suggest is to alongside with Crow to deliberately select primary sources that help to extend that. We know that that's good teaching. Um, and again, it's directly going back to what Crystal, I believe, said earlier. This is directly related to the standards that you're teaching. So you know that that's good practice as well. Um, and then um, again, the, the history lab model that we discussed, when you're presenting sources to students, you're allowing them to answer those open ended questions. So they're reading across those sources. They are pulling from that meaning. They're meaning making with that. So um, that removes this sort of piece of um, controversiality about it that the teacher is pushing a student or a group of students in one direction or another, what you're really doing is you're giving them a variety of sources from multiple perspectives. Um, so at that elementary level, which is my background, would um, then present um, sources alongside Crow, for example, that help to give a, um, a more thorough picture. But the students are drawing from those. They're looking and they're saying, okay, here's this set of primary and secondary sources. What happened in 1898? And then what's the, um, the lasting impact of that today? Great, yeah. Kara, did you wanna add anything? I was just going to say, I, you know, I, that is a big question and it's something I, I think um, we're still figuring it, that, that out to a certain degree, but fourth grade focuses on North Carolina. So I don't see how we can't at least, you know, just very briefly um, start to introduce the topic uh, without doing a disservice to the, the standards that we're teaching. Um, in the, the drafts that I've been reviewing of the, the new curriculum standards that are going to be implemented over the next few years, at one point I know in one of the proposed crosswalk documents, there was a mention of 1898 for fourth grade. So I think even if it's not happening right now in some classrooms, it should be in the next few years. I will say there is a, a great person here in Wilmington, Cedric Harrison, who um, is the founder of the Support the, support the Port um, group. And he has developed a coloring book about um, events that are important in Black history in Wilmington. And the very last image in that coloring book, it, and it's designed for K-5 students, the very last image is the daily record. Um, and I actually, I've been very fortunate, both of my children, from a personal viewpoint, both of my children have gone to schools that have used his coloring book. And it was amazing last year when my second grader came home and said, Mom, when did the daily record burn down? So I, and, and we had a very good conversation about it. And while I felt better equipped and prepared because I'm an educator than some parents might, I think that connects too to what, you know, Corey was saying, like, you teach the parents. Um, it can be done, and, and I think that Cedric's, um, like I said, his, if you go to his website, Support the Port, you can find that resource there. Um, and I, so I think through avenues like that, finding, you know, finding something that connects us to those younger grade levels. We don't want to, of course, trivialize it, and, but his coloring book doesn't. It, it, it handles it in a very serious way. So, um, yeah, I think we absolutely should find those ways. We might have to be a little more creative and find some um, some different methods to do that, but I think it's very important on that K-5 level. 
You guys, thank you so much. There's still amazing questions coming in. We still have 100 people with us. I feel like now we should just turn on everybody's camera and unmute everybody and all, you know, have a drink and keep talking half the night. But uh, we need to get our teachers to bed because I know you guys are going to be right back here tomorrow. So I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Buchanan, Dr. Ward, Crystal Reagan, Corey Gerbanks, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Corey, bless you for what you do. You are a rock star teacher. We will be thinking of you tomorrow morning when you're Zooming along with all of these folks um, on the call. But I really appreciate all of you guys joining us. Um, the last thing I just want to do here really quick is let everybody know that our next program, if um, you are interested, hopefully you will join us. It will not be three hours, it will be an hour and a half. Um, it is challenging the misconceptions of slavery with the incredible life of Omar Ibn Said, who was, um, ended up enslaved in Guilford, um, in, here in North Carolina. Uh, so join us for that October 13th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Thank you again to the Breitmayer Foundation, to our partners at the North Carolina Museum of History. And the very last thought I just want to leave all of you with is this. Um, again, from Democracy Betrayed, history is not likely to offer tidy lessons or easy answers. And yet, we must all remain committed to what Charles Chestnut called the shining thread of hope, nurtured even through a hard and bitter history that permitted him to close his account of the Wilmington race riot by declaring, there's time enough, but none to spare. So teachers, there's time enough, but none to spare. Thank you. Have a great evening. We hope we'll see you again very soon. Bye, everybody.